Ольга Сергеевна, вас не слышно, если вы что-то говорите. Так, извините, вы почему мне раньше не сказали, да? <laughs> Простите. Uh, ничего не было слышно, да? Я так понимаю. So you couldn't hear anything, yes? Okay, today we are having a technical regional seminar on migration statistics organized by the Federal uh, Service of uh, for uh, statistics of Russia with support of UN, um, the Fund for Population and Central Start. CS region is one of the largest migration systems in the world. And in an under pandemic, millions of uh, labor migrants are in the uh, countries, so, uh, or they're not citizens, and hundreds of uh, thousands of people uh, plan to move permanent residents within that region. Questions of migrations, uh, migration are, uh, are among the most important questions on the political agenda of our state's deficiency or low quality of data not only makes the assessments of migration difference, but interferes with the investigation of a different uh, economic and social and political uh, consequences. Today, we're going to listen to the lead experts of the largest international organizations and national statistical offices on key issues of migration statistics. Participation of such experts in pastoral seminar, high status and attracts a great interest. Among the registered, there are about 120 persons. They represent national statistical offices, international organizations, and scientific community. Due to the uh, tightness of the program, I ask the esteemed speakers uh, to keep uh, within the established time limits. Additional presentations uh, with a prepared presentation after five minutes and speeches from the audience to three minutes without presentation. In future, we hope to plan the work of such seminars in such a way so that for the discussion of the presentation, we'll have more time. Since we're going to have simultaneous translation, I ask you not to speed up your speech so that our esteemed interpreter, Tatiana Vasilva, will be able uh, to make her important work. Uh, for switching uh, uh, from Russian to English, please use the button globe in the lower part of Zoom panel and uh, questions please write into chat. Uh, they will be grouped uh, and they will be pronounced in the course of the seminar. Uh, together uh, with Zoom seminar, we're going to have a YouTube translation on two channels, English and Russian channel, and you can switch uh, for, uh, both channels. And that is the, uh, will be the end of technical issues. Allow me to uh, start our seminar and to give the floor uh, to the head uh, of the Department of Population and Healthcare Statistics of Rostad, Svetlana Nikitina, uh, 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 from 2019 Federal Service of State Statistics, jointly with the Regional Office of UN Fund for Population uh, for the countries of Eastern Europe and Central Asia, with support of the International Center of Statistics Expertise Center staff, is implementing the project Qualitative Data Efficient Policy. The project is targeted at improving the collection, analysis, and use of data on population for development of scientifically grounded policy in CS days. It is financed by the government of the Russian Federation, and provides for assistance of technical and methodological support to statistical officers of Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. 
key partners on implementation of the project are Interstate Statistical Committee of CSS, High School of Economics, so the Institute of Demographic Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences, European Economic uh, Commission of UN, and Statistical Division of UN. Uh, for 2021, will provide in technical assistance to countries of the region we plan to organize a series of online events with participation of international and national experts including seminars on presentation and dissemination of data of the census on development of potential of statistical offices in the sphere of monitoring of sustainable development goals as well on digital analytical platform population uh, the, that platform includes a, a model on migration statistics that will contain administrative data collected by different departments as well as data of census and sample surveys so that uh, the theme of migration is important for the Russian statistics. I wish you successful work uh, at our today's seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Svetlana Yurna. The floor is given to Lenny Armitage, Regional Dineta on Eastern Europe and Central Asia, the front of, you know, on population. Please, Lana. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Chudinovsky. Good afternoon, distinguished Mr. Kulikov, Ms. Nikitina, Mr. Politov, dear participants of the seminar, it's wonderful to see so many of you today, colleagues and friends. On behalf of UNFPA, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the opening of this regional seminar on migration statistics, organized jointly with our longstanding partner, the Federal State Statistical Service of the Russian Federation, Rostat, in partnership with Centrostat. The regional seminar is being conducted, as you said, in the framework of UNFPA's regional CIS POP program, Better Data for Better Policies, funded by the Russian Federation. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has referred to demographic shifts, including international migration, as one of the mega trends shaping our common future. Since 1976, when the United Nations adopted its first set of recommendations on statistics of international migration, the importance of measuring, monitoring, and managing international migration stocks and flows has increased dramatically. In our region, migration continues to offer opportunities for individuals and states alike, but it also poses social, political, and public health challenges. Despite the importance of international migration, the necessary statistics to characterize migration flows, monitor changes over time, and provide governments with a solid basis for formulating and implementing policies are still often inadequate. And although good progress has been made at national and international levels in improving the quality and usability of data on migration, through improved harmonization of underlying metadata, data exchange practices, and related legislation, there is still a way to go for migration data to reach a level of completeness and consistency that is common in other areas, for example, for data on mortality or fertility. To this extent, a continuous process of political dialogue is needed to ensure that the frameworks on measurement and reporting of migration keep pace with the increased demands for information and knowledge. Recognizing the importance and need to improve migration statistics, UNFPA and Rostat, within the CIS POP Better Data for Better Policies program, have organized this seminar so that countries can share and exchange their knowledge and experience on using migration statistics to study and understand migration trends, and develop policies and mechanisms that allow them to live up to their responsibilities for respecting the rights and ensuring the well being of migrants and fully harnessing the benefits that come with migration. Today, we are joined by professionals from the National Statistical Services, Migration Services, international organizations, expert and academic institutions to contribute to knowledge sharing and discussion. I hope that the seminar will lead to fruitful conversations around important themes in migration statistics. The seminar will serve as a platform to enhance the capacities of the participants to understand migration trends 
and their implications for demographic shifts and for sustainable development. Moreover, it will help strengthen the regional network of experts and professionals in the field of migration, population, and development statistics. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the government of the Russian Federation for the financial support provided to the CIS POP project, which enables this seminar to take place. And to thank in particular, Mr. Konstantin Kulikov and his department for the support provided in its implementation. Ms. Chudinovsky, Ms. Nikitina, dear participants, thank you for being here with us. I wish all of us a very productive seminar. I thank you. Большое спасибо, Аланна, за такое воодушевляющее приветственное слово. Разрешите мне предоставить подиум Константину Кулику. С принятием повестки 2030 больше внимания стало уделяться. It is important to know that uh, reliable and accessible statistical data are the basis for safe, uh, orderly and legal migration, understanding of the needs of migrants and their families. The special topicality was uh, this same quite uh, when the strategies were developed for overcoming the negative uh, social economic consequences of pandemic COVID-19. At the same time, the inclusion into the system of global indicators creates difficulties for the state bodies preparing official statistics. Developing countries have to strengthen and adapt their national statistical systems for satisfying these needs under the insufficiency of financial and personnel provision. And the expenses for increasing the potential in the sphere of data and statistics are only 0.33% of the official assistance to development based on OSD methodology. The Russian Federation is a country. The history of its state statistic accounts over 200 years is actively involved in international statistical cooperation. Our basic approaches to that interaction are unchanged. We think it is important to retain objective and devaluated character of statistical data and to show their compatibility because the state using them to develop uh, managing uh, decisions and development of the priority. Uh, uh, can you be a bit slower? <laughs> Having statistic, a significant statistical experience, Russia is trying to share it with its international partners, primarily by the programs of technical assistance. Uh, thus, for instance, uh, SCAP uh, line for Asia and uh, Pacific, due to the Russian voluntary contribution, six uh, such projects are implemented for the amount of 1.5 million dollars this initiative concern certain aspects of statistics and the issues of education in that sphere we assess highly the cooperation with you and fund for population in the sphere of uh, population uh, uh, due to our joint project within uh, CIS, we have extensive work on uh, supporting the uh, world round of uh, population census with in the possibilities of recipient uh, countries to use uh, digital cryptography and geopositioning system. We expand the uh, practices of using registers for simplifying data collection. We establish strong contacts and data exchange between statistical uh, offices of CIS states, and we promote a unified digital platform of propagation of demographic uh, indicators. I'm sure that today's regional seminar organized by Rostat uh, and UNFPA will be an important contribution to promotion of the international statistics and development of multilateral cooperation on the most topical issues of the agenda in the sphere of population. Thank you very much, Konstantin. The floor is given to Dmitry Politov, Executive Director of Centrostat. Please, Dmitry. 
uh, uh, participants, distinguished colleagues. Of course, that is a great honor for uh, a non-professional to open the first uh, educational uh, seminar center. But it's highly important for us take into account the significance of that seminar for Rus Russian and foreign conflicts, and it is a joint initiative with the UNFPA uh, to create new knowledge and possibilities within a common space at Centristat. Centristat is a subsidiary of Rostat, which is dealing with organization of educational activity and the coverage with implementation of different international initiatives. We try to form such events proceeding from the expectations and needs of our regional partners, as well as promoting to create new competences among our participants within the country and abroad. Deep understanding of the trends of uh, important but uh, give a lot of possibilities for meeting uh, facing the challenges of maternity uh, to uh, ensure the sustainable development goals it is possible only if we develop the statistical operators and take methodological condition decisions in related area center start uh, investigates the possibility of implementation educational task aimed at needs of the partners at the russian federation and we're happy together with you to find uh, such new solutions that will create for our participants a fresh uh, platform for further growth. This is the end of my presentation. I would like to thank you for having found the possibility to join our event today, and I would like to wish you success. I think it will uh, meet your most uh, high expectation. Thank you, Dmitry. I would like to thank our guests and friends uh, who have made these wonderful welcoming addresses and with uh, a bit ahead of schedule even. And we pass on to the technical seminar. And the first session will be dealing with a very important issue for all statisticians, measuring of migration uh, through population censuses, international recommendations, and national practices. I give the floor with great pleasure to Fiona willis Nunes, Office of the Statistical Division of the United Nations uh, Economic Commission uh, for Europe, UNEC, and she will make a presentation of the theme. Fiona, please. Thank you very much, Olga, and thank you to all the organizers and the hosts of today's meeting. Um, I'm going to do my best to speak very slowly. I know that we Brits have a reputation for speaking far too fast. Um, but I can hear that it must be extremely hard work for our interpreter today, to whom I would also like to say thank you. Um, let me begin by sharing my screen and if somebody would kindly let me know when you can see it. Yes, it's fine. Yes, we can see it. You can Excellent. See it. Okay, thank you. So I'll introduce myself. My name is Fiona Willis-Nunez, as Olga said. I'm representing the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. Um, I should begin by saying that I'm a little bit of an imposter in today's seminar. I'm here um, representing my colleague, Paolo Valente, who is in fact the main person working on migration statistics here in UNECE, who unfortunately couldn't join us today, but he does send his greetings and his thanks for the invitation. So I must say that I'm not an expert in the area of migration statistics, but I promise to do my best to talk you through what I'm going to say today. And let me just say a couple of words about UNECE for those who don't know, although I do see many familiar faces um, on, the, on the meeting today. UNECE, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, is a little bit of a misnomer because in fact we represent 56 member countries encompassing all of Europe as is commonly understood, but also all of the countries of Eastern Europe, the Caucasus and Central Asia, um, including also all of the countries of North America and many, many other countries are also working with us around the world in the Conference of European Statisticians, which actually includes countries as far afield as Australia and New Zealand. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is just a little whistle-stop tour of how UNECE and the international community in statistics in general supports the countries in our region on conducting population and housing censuses 
and in so doing on producing statistics on migration. So. Now the main documents produced by the international, the UN statistical community to support that work are these two, which I'm showing here. First of all, one produced by our colleagues in the United Nations Statistics Division, the recommendations on statistics of international migration, which Alana referred to in her introduction. And these are currently under revision. From the point of view of our region, the UNECE region, our most important document relating to international guidance for censuses is this one, the recommendations for the 2020 censuses of population and housing. You'll see that that was last published in the year 2015. It comes out in a new revision every 10 years. And I, as I will mention to you at the end of my intervention today, it's just starting the process for coming out with the next edition. So we will be working on, on updating that. Now, how does any of this relate to migration? Well, as I'm sure you know, a population and housing census is something that happens every 10 years. They're referred to as decennial censuses. They have certain core features that define them as censuses. They are simultaneous. That means they collect a snapshot at one defined point in time across the entire country. They are universal. That means they cover everybody within the country, or at least that is, that is the goal to which countries strive to work. And they are individual. That means the information they collect relates to every single person. So within the Conference of European Statisticians recommendations on censuses, we have recommended core topics and non-core topics. And when it comes to migration, those core topics, the things which we strongly recommend that countries should be collecting in order to produce basic statistics on, on international migration are the country of birth, country of citizenship, and whether or not the individual has ever resided abroad and if so, when they arrived in the country, the year of arrival in the country. The recommendations also include a number of non-core topics, such as the country of birth of parents, citizenship acquisition, country of previous usual residence over, overseas, abroad, and the total duration of residence in the country. So these are topics which we recommend that countries might like to collect as one means of gathering information for migration statistics, um, but they are not the sort of central things that are recommended. So it's worth having a look at how these recommendations are actually implemented in the region that we're, that today's seminar is, is dealing with. And you can have a very detailed look at how all of the CES recommendations were implemented in the Eastern Europe, Caucasus and Central Asia region by having a look at this publication, which is available on the UNECE website. This goes through one by one all of the variables that are recommended. And it has a look at whether countries actually collected that information and how they did so in the previous round of censuses and the 2020 round of population and housing censuses. Now we find that two of those three core variables I mentioned, country of birth and country of citizenship were pretty much fine. Um, throughout the region, they were, there were no significant issues seen. However, the third of them ever resided abroad and the year of arrival in the country was in fact in the last round of censuses only collected by four countries in this region. That was uh, Belarus, Georgia, Kazakhstan, and the Republic of Moldova. And as I mentioned, you can have a look at this full publication. It is available both in English and in Russian on the UNEC website. Of course, as you know, we're currently in the next round of population and housing censuses, the round which is referred to as the 2020 round, although in fact, 
that round covers um, quite some number of years and a, a majority of countries, in fact, are aiming at a 2021 census in the current round. Some number of countries have already conducted the censuses at this round. A few lucky ones managed, in fact, to do it before the COVID-19 pandemic sent everything awry, um, including a few lucky countries in, in today's region. Um, but the vast majority of countries have been hit rather hard in conducting their censuses. And that has, as I'm sure you know, led to the necessity to postpone the census in quite some number of countries, as well as changes to enumeration strategies. So in particular, shifts towards strategies that don't involve face-to-face -face contact. Now, this is a trend that in fact was underway already. Many countries are moving um, towards online self-response, telephone interviews, or indeed away from the traditional form of census at all, meaning that in fact they might be moving towards, excuse me, gathering information from other data sources such as registers and administrative data sources. So in fact, what we see is that the COVID-19 pandemic has to a great extent accelerated shifts that were already underway. Now at the same time, of course, we can see that there has been a general reduction in international migration flows. Many, many uh, borders have been closed. People have been strongly discouraged from traveling. So at the same time as the challenges to the actual conduct of a census, there are going to be challenges in counting migration in the current census round. So in fact, a lot remains to be seen and we do, we look forward to finding out more about countries' experiences at the end of this round. And the next edition of the uh, implementation of the recommendations, I think will be a fascinating one that hopefully we can all draw lessons from. Now, although I was asked to talk about population censuses and international recommendations, I do want to just give you a little bit of information just to close off my presentation about other sources of international support, recommendations, standards, and guides that we offer in UNECE related to migration statistics. In particular, this one here, which I'm showing you, published in 2016, um, although that is a few years ago, it still remains an extremely useful document. Um, this one was produced with the generous support of a project funded by the Russian Federation. And this is the handbook on the use of administrative sources and sample surveys to measure international migration in CIS countries. And I mentioned this because one of the um, points made in this handbook is that a population census is of course an extremely useful tool because of the features I mentioned at the beginning, its simultaneity, its universality, but its usefulness uh, is limited. It must be complemented by other sources because of course it happens only once every 10 years and flows of migration are too fast and too complex to be entirely captured by censuses alone. So censuses need to be seen as a a foundation, a source of benchmarking, but they need to be seen as the beginning and administrative sources and sample surveys um, need, to be, need to be part of the picture. Uh, Fiona, your microphone is turned off and we seem to uh, to have lost the translator. So can you can we please uh, make a small pause? Just a moment. Please let me know when I can begin again. Yes, you should continue, thank you. Okay, I, I was told that the, we had lost the translator. Are we back with the translator oh, now? I see. 
I don't know. Катя, у нас все в порядке с переводом? No, no, нет. Uh, I'm sorry, yes, we're trying to, to stop. Okay, okay, I will wait. Please, no okay, I'm sorry for that. I could try to speak in Russian, but I don't think I would get far. I'd better wait. <laughs> Переводчик, вы можете продолжать. Фион, you can go on. Okay, apologies for that pause. Um, I understand that I was muted at one point, so I'm not sure whether you heard what I was saying here, but I just wanted to mention that there are some other publications Прошу offering... прощения, но переводчик он не выходит в эфир, хотя все технически нормально. Just one second. Okay. You cannot connect. Вы русский выбрали, все нормально. Все, теперь можно переводить. Yes, uh, Fiona. Yes, please, Fiona. Can you continue? Okay, okay. I'm almost done anyway. So I'm just mentioning that there are some other publications in support of producing migration statistics. These ones are only available in English. And I have put the link up on this slide for where you can find those. So these are on topics of defining and measuring circular migration, guidance on data integration for measuring migration, measuring international labor mobility, and guidance on the use of longitudinal data for migration statistics. These are all forms of guidance which have been put together by international teams of experts from national statistical offices and international organizations all across the region. And these have all been endorsed by the Conference of European Statisticians. Some areas of work that are currently in progress, um, as I mentioned over our, our colleagues over in New York in UNSD are producing um, a revision of the recommendations on statistics of international migration. And here in our region in UNECE, my colleague Paolo is coming to the end of some work with a task force on new data sources for measuring international migration and cross-border mobility. So that's looking at things like the use of big data, social media, other innovative sources. And that's expected to be ready with a final output in 2022. And finally, let me just give a plug for my own work. As I mentioned at the beginning, we're starting the process, which we do every 10 years of updating the recommendations on population and housing censuses. So for the 2030 round, we will need to produce recommendations in 2025. And we have just put out a call for experts to join us in a number of thematic task forces, one of which is migration. So those of you who feel that you would be able to contribute, and I must stress that we will be working in English only, um, we would love to hear from you. I have put the link here, or if you don't have time to jot that down, you can send me an email afterwards and I can send you the link or tell you more information about what it will entail to be in this task team and have experts from around the region represented to help us update the recommendations in time for the next round of censuses. Thank you very much for your attention. I apologize for the technical hitches in the middle, and I do look forward to hearing from everybody else in today's seminar. Thank you. Fiona, огромное спасибо. Очень интересная презентация. Это вы должны нас извинить за технические проблемы. Это совершенно не ваша вина, но такое случается, поскольку мы... Uh, Fiona, that is no uh, fault. Uh, uh, we have to apologize for technical problems. Uh, probably there will be some 
uh, questions later. Now I invite the experts from the national statistical uh, offices so they, they will uh, speak on the census in terms of measuring population migrations and we'll see how the national level where they use uh, these uh, recommendations that were so interesting described by film. We give the floor to the chief specialist and expert of uh, the migration of the population, Federal Statistical Service of Russia, Ruslan Kalmanov. Please, your presentation, Ruslan. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, dear participants of the seminar. We cannot hear you well. Please come closer to the microphone. Today in Russia, the census is the only uh, uh, source of information accumulated about migrants. Uh, for instance, the place of birth and the citizenship information is gathered uh, during uh, these census. For instance, our last census was in 2012. Please, will you please show the last slide. Uh, during the, uh, the last three years, the Rostad uh, is uh, following recommendations and includes in the program census the key and non key issues of migration, non core issues that allow to get information on international and internal migrants, preservation of traditional issues, and inclusion of a new one ensures a succession. To development of the census program. We get information of the date, uh, place of birth, citizenship, from what you, uh, you live uh, permanently in this uh, populated area, from your birth or not. Where have you lived uh, one year uh, before the census? Your uh, former place of residence? Have you lived uh, for more than 12 months in other countries? If yes, where did you live before arriving to Russia? The year of arriving? additional uh, questions and questionnaires in all the Russian census, uh, 2002, 2010, 2021. This form was introduced in 2002. The issues of intercultural characteristics, ethnical affinity, uh, the issues of where uh, the place of work of the respondent is located in the same uh, populated area in another region, in another country, as well as a separate short um, census form for the foreigners who have stayed in the territory less than one year. Questions about the country of permanent residence are out of time. Thank you very much for your brief presentation, Ruslan. I can add uh, on behalf of the sciences that the questionnaire as to uh, people who arrive uh, temporarily, uh, this is a debatable practice uh, similar to the question on registration. The first uh, questionnaire did for uh, show its efficiency during the uh, previous censuses. So we recommend Rostat uh, to abandon that practice and the question of registration is uh, administrative and a surveillance question and it might provoke some fears among the respondents about the purpose of the census. So I will ask Rostat to apply a creative approach to that practice. I give the floor to Valentina Estrati, head of the census department of the National Bureau of Statistics of Moldova. Please, Valentina, I hope we'll hear not only uh, how you measure migration during census, but also how statisticians of Moldova act uh, during the inter uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the possibilities to make a presentation this seminar. I will. My presentation will be in English. My screen. Just let me know if uh, you can see it. Пока еще нет. We don't see it so far. Да, все хорошо, продолжайте. Thank you. Please continue. Um, I will try to present shortly uh, how do we measure migration in population censuses and in the intercensal period. Uh, uh, so just uh, some uh, 
uh, information about our national censuses. Uh, uh, since our independence, we have conducted three censuses, two censuses on, of population, uh, one of population census in 2004, uh, the second one, uh, population and housing census, was in 2014, and we had one agricultural census in 2011. Uh, if speaking uh, about the migration topics that were included in the, um, uh, in the census uh, questionnaire uh, on persons, uh, we, um, uh, we have uh, uh, followed the recommended um, topics uh, uh, from uh, UNIC and the most uh, core topics were present in 2023. Uh, as you can see, we uh, have uh, included the question of uh, country and place of birth uh, uh, for both censuses, 2004-2014, of citizenship. Uh, uh, ever resided abroad, we have uh, um, included the, for the first time in 2014, and we will uh, use this question also for the next uh, census, and the uh, place of birth, a previous place of usual residence and date of arrival. Uh, if speaking about the recommended non-core topics, we also use two of them, country of previous usual residence abroad, and reason for migration, whether it was for international or um, uh, internal migration. Uh, I would like to uh, speak uh, very uh, briefly about the sources or for measuring migration in the intercensal period. Uh, National Bureau of Statistics has uh, information or receives information from uh, different uh, institutions especially from the state register of population, but it is aggregated data on uh, migration. Also, we have information from Ministry of Internal Affairs. Uh, and so the data are aggregated. And from uh, Bureau of Migration and Asylum, the data are also aggregated. Uh, all the uh, data that we produce from administrative data are on our website, especially in our statistical data bank. Uh, since 2013, uh, we have uh, we received information on individual data, uh, nevertheless they are anonymized, on border crossings from border police. And uh, this uh, um, gave us the possibility to improve our uh, migration statistics. Uh, because uh, from the above three sources, uh, we have only registered migration. But uh, from uh, border crossings, we can uh, uh, estimate uh, also the unregistered migration. I will speak uh, uh, lower. Uh, and the other, info, other sources on um, uh, migration are the population censuses and the household surveys. Uh, as also Fiona mentioned, the population censuses are one in 10 mm -hmm. years. Uh, uh, they provide the information, so we provide information only on stocks and mainly on uh, uh, immigration, uh, disaggregated by uh, uh, different characteristics. Also, information on pop uh, from population census, we have an uh, uh, application to visualize the uh, uh, census data from 2014, and it's also uh, on our website. Uh, why we uh, were looking for new sources to improve our uh, migration estimates, um, as I mentioned, we have a high flow on, of uh, unregistered internal migration, especially immigration. Uh, also to align the national statistical system uh, with international and uh, European standards and to implement the definition of usual residence uh, in the official statistics, so the one that we used uh, for the census. Uh, I would like to mention that, uh, uh, of course, we uh, succeed to improve our migration statistics, and it was uh, uh, due to our um, uh, colleagues from uh, UNFPA and uh, uh, Swiss uh, Agency for Development, and also at our national level, it was uh, 
uh, our government, uh, also border police that provided the data and public services uh, agency. Um, if speaking about uh, who is an immigrant and who is an emigrant, uh, the, the definition that uh, we applied uh, to estimate the international migration is a person who entered the Republic of Moldova and stayed in the country for at least 12 months uh, after arrival. Uh, after living abroad for at least 12 months. So uh, I also should like to mention that temporary cumulative stays of up to three months are not considered as a break of the 12 month period. Uh, if speaking uh, about the emigrant uh, is a person who exited the Republic of Moldova and lived abroad for at least 12 months after living in the country for at least 12 months before, before uh, um, exiting the country. So uh, it is um, uh, the same that the temporary cumulative stays of up to three months are not considered as a break of the 12 month period. And this information uh, also um, permitted us to uh, calculate the net migration that improved our uh, population estimates also. Uh, well, can, may I kindly ask you to wrap up your presentation, please? Oh, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and estimating international migration from border crossing, uh, for estimating, for example, one year, we need to uh, three consecutive years uh, in order to see the status of the person uh, before the movement and after the movement. And it is the same for, uh, for every year. As I mentioned, uh, for year two, T, we need t, t minus one and t plus one uh, years. Uh, here I have some uh, uh, data from 2014 and 2018 on the uh, international migration. It is very diverse. It is very um, high, I may say. And uh, uh, the net migration in 2018 were minus 41,000 uh, person. Uh, the, here we have some data on uh, disaggregated by age and sex. And uh, I would like shortly to mention the lesson learned that we have from uh, uh, our, um, uh, from the collaboration with border police in estimating international migration. So partnership with data holder and data user are very, very important. Uh, continuous communication throughout the process of data production with all data users. Uh, peer to peer learning and sharing, uh, but we also need access to uh, personal data from administrati administrative sources to improve, uh, to continuously improve the data. Uh, we also have to harmonize uh, the current secondary legislate, uh, legislative uh, framework and to continue modernize our uh, statistics. And our next steps we intend to develop and integrate informational system of social statistics that it will contain also the module of migration and uh, to estimate international and internal migration at subnational level using the border uh, crossings uh, uh, from our border police. Thank you very much. Большое спасибо, Валентина. У меня есть вопрос, но я его задам, если у нас останется. Thank you, Valentina. I have a question, but I will ask them if we have the time at the end of the session. Now I give the floor to Irina Alexander Sbarska, head of the Social Demographic Statistics Division of the Interstate Statistical Committee of CIA States. Please, Irina Alexandrovna, your presentation and your speech. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I hope that you can hear me. Yes, we can hear and you can see. Please share the screen. I understand. Share the screen. Yes, yes. I'm going to be very brief. And first, I would like to tell you that measurement of migration and quality of statistical data on migration 
for the CS region is a very important and very acute uh, problem because if we analyze the dynamics of statistical data and the dynamics of interstate balances of migration, we have seen significant uh, differences, even in the case of statistical paradox related with the following. Some countries had mutual positive uh, migration balance uh, during not year, but even several years. We have analyzed the situation and of course, we understand well enough that the migration statistics is based on the migration laws. And of course, these national differences, these national differences in uh, registration, in definitions, led to such distortions of the data. We even once conducted uh, very extensive work. We recalculated from 1991, from the beginning of uh, CIS formation, the balance of migration for each country. And the result of this work was the assessment of the uh, population of the Commonwealth of Independent uh, States that was about 4.55 uh, million less than uh, it was shown to us during a long period of time. Of course, we often mention the quality of migration statistics. We can see the efforts undertaken by the countries in order to improve the quality of these statistics. But we were very much hopeful that uh, the uh, forthcoming round of census of 2020, 2020 will play an important role. When in 2016, the Council of the Head of the Baltic Sea States decided to have a round of the census in the CIS region, this decision had two key issues. First, the importance and the reasonability of approximating uh, the uh, times, uh, time levels of international centers. It was even uh, a time interval was proposed from October 2019 to October 2020. And the second theme, which was approved by the resolution of the Council of the Heads of CS States, is harmonization of the main issues of the program of census. Uh, primarily, of course, we meant the issues related with harmonization and similar approach to measuring migration in the course of census. As for the time limits of organizing national censuses, all of us were in a very difficult situation. Our colleagues from Azerbaijan and Belarus conducted the census in the early uh, time plan in October 2019. The colleague from Tajikistan, despite uh, serious uh, limitations and restrictions, carried out the census in October 2020. Armenia, Armenia Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan and the Russian Federation took the decision to postpone the national census uh, to a later date. Nowadays, we determine the time period for census of the population in Armenia and Kazakhstan. This is the, this is the October of 2021. The Russian Federation and the Kyrgyz Republic so far have yet, yet finally decided uh, the official dates of uh, the census. But we hope very much that the epidemiological situation in all the countries would make it possible to organize the censuses of the population. Their colleagues are being prepared for this important event. This is what uh, concerns the time limits and that unfortunately is under the question mark so far. 
as to the final dates of the census of population. In 2022, the census uh, would be organized in Turkmenistan. In 2023, in Uzbekistan, who first organizes the census uh, during 30 years, Moldova and the Ukraine has also planned uh, the national census. As to the questions for inclusion into the census program, taking the opportunity, I would like once again to thank all my colleagues from the national statistical offices of the SAS states with whom we have developed the subunit of questions on migration recommended for inclusion into the program of national censuses. These are the questions uh, with different prompts, with instructions, with provisions of the instructions that had to be prepared. We prepared uh, the, uh, the layouts of tables and the whole package of documents was approved by the heads of the national statistical offices of uh, the CI states and approved by the resolution of the Council of the Heads of the Governments of the CIA states. Taking the opportunity, Olga Sergeyevna, I would like uh, to thank you on the assistance which you provided to us uh, during that period of, uh, and we uh, carry on your cooperation with you. Uh, you are a long-term partner for us. The main themes of migration in the census of 2020 are listed on the screen. They fully comply with recommendation of the international organizations, primarily recommendations of the Conference of European Statisticians. We all participated in the preparation of this document. We had very hot discussions, so we have not invented anything new. Our task was just to approve uh, and to coordinate the international set of questions that will make it possible for us to get the main characteristics of migration and the scope and flows based on the data of national censuses. This is a very important information, despite the fact that we will not manage to fully solve the question of converging of the uh, time periods for the census, at least. Uh, methodolo the information will be methodologically comparable in terms of formulation, and we have observed that comparability. So all this uh, information in detailed form is uh, uploaded on our site. All of you are know, uh, knowledgeable and know this material, they work with you. Uh, so we're ahead of time already. And we hope that this work will bring its results. So uh, I end my presentation. And once again, I would like to thank uh, everyone for their attention to leave the countries that are preparing for the censuses to have the censuses. Thank you, Irina Alexandrovna. Within this session, we have three minutes. Probably someone of the experts of the National Statistical Offices would like to use a minute and a half to tell about measuring migration, the censuses of round of 2020. Please raise your hand or write into chat because time is flowing quickly. Yes, we'll start. Switch on the microphone. Uh, good afternoon. I welcome the uh, seminar participants who will give brief information on how we had our census in 2019. Immediately, I would like to stress three minutes. The census in 2019 was carried out by Belstart uh, based on internet uh, questionnaire, uh, uh, PC uh, uh, tablet computers using the data from administrative sources. Speaking about uh, migration, we uh, followed the recommendation of the Conference of European Statisticians and ensuring comparability with data of the previous censuses. 
the census form of 2019 included the questions concerning internal, external, and pendular migration. There were questions about the place of birth, continuous uh, uh, state, the date, uh, uh, year, and cause of arrival to a populated area or to Belarus. We are asked the populated area and the place of work if he doesn't work at his place of uh, residence. We ask information about living uh, abroad before coming to Belarus. Besides this time, the respondents aged at age 15 uh, were asked about the planning of going abroad. For what time period do they plan to go abroad and for what reason? The respondents were also asked about the reasons why they are not working in their populated area, in their place of residence. Uh, just a couple of issues concerning the outcomes of the census in the Republic of Belarus, for instance. The number of people who live in the populated area since their birth was 2009, it decreased by 6%. Thus, the population of Belarus became more mobile. People are moving uh, more and more between the uh, populated areas. Among the external migrants uh, to the Republic of Belarus, the main flow uh, is coming from the Asian states, 88% of all external migrants, and from migrants among migrants uh, from Asian states, 93% were accounted by migrants for the Russian Federation, uh, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. Belarus has an active process of modernization to the cities. Uh, and uh, large settlements, 1.7 uh, re uh, respondents moved from rural areas, whereas from towns uh, to rural areas, less than uh, 830,000 moved. And Gina Belstadt has published a lot of data, including the date of migration. We published the bulletin on migration characteristics of the population of Belarus Republic, which is available on the site of Belstar. Thank you very much. And I hope that the questions of internal migration will be considered later. I give the floor for Rima Shenibava, head of the uh, Census Department of uh, Statistical Committee of Kyrgyzstan. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. I would like to tell you about the census, which we're planning in Kyrgyzstan. As has been said, we planned the census during the period from October 2019 to October 2020. We wanted to conduct the census in March 2020, but unfortunately due to COVID-19 pandemic, five years between the, before the census, we had to uh, stop uh, to discontinue the process. And today, so far, we uh, are still determining the forthcoming census. As to the questionnaire concerning migration, as has mentioned by Irina Alexandrovna, we have uh, developed a block of questions on migration. If we compare it with the uh, previous uh, censuses, which we conducted to national uh, censuses in, 20, uh, in 1999 and 2009, the uh, block of questions of mobility coincide. There were some clarifications uh, and we included all the questions into the question and we hope that we'll have a, a good basis for analyzing the measuring of migration in the CIA states. I would like to note that in 2009, taking into account migration, we uh, uh, didn't use the recommendations. We included the population uh, of migrants who went abroad more than one year ago in uh, this uh, census, we have excluded it, and we're going to count the population following the recommendation of the European Conference of Statisticians. All those who were, uh, live in that, all those who left the country more than one year ago, will not be uh, taken into account as the population. Since our country is a country uh, who gives away migrants. We have um, a lot of people who go away. There was a question about 
uh, the number of migrants who live abroad. So we have developed a special questionnaire and the questions will be asked to members of the household about the former members of their households who live abroad for one year or more. So certain information on the departing migrants will be collected uh, in the course of that forthcoming census. That is brief information concerning the census. Thank you very much, Rima. That is very interesting information. We're looking forward to publications uh, and analytical works of the national researchers. Will you please ask questions in chat? And I hope that I will have some time to ask the questions now. We pass on to the next session. Anna Prokhorova, an expert of the European Economic Commission, independent research and consultant, uh, statistics of labor migration and remittances in the CIS countries. Please, your presentation. And I hope that the states uh, who uh, have sample surveys of households with the ex expanded models of migrations will actively participate. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, thank you for the invitation. I will discuss three projects concerning management of migration, measuring migration and uh, remittances covering three periods before, during and after the pandemic. And thus the tasks facing the projects were different. Prior to pandemic, it was important to harmonize the approach to measuring migration and remittances. During pandemic, it was important to understand how to adapt the approaches to ensure timely and high quality data collection under quarantine conditions. And finally, now, after the restrictions, strict restrictions have been removed, though sometimes they are introduced, we have to reconsider the approaches that we use during many years to adapt them to the many changing models of behavior of the migrants and family members to show the impact of global digitalization on their financial behavior and their financial literacy. Please be a bit slow. Two projects, the project uh, that were realized by UNEC with support of the World Bank and the third project is the project on the international organization migration supported by the Swiss Agency on Cooperation Development that will be finalized, was finalized in May 2021. The first project harmonized model on migration for measuring migration and the remittances in countries of Western Europe, Caucasus and Central Asia. Before the development of harmonized model, we conducted preliminary work on analyzing the sample surveys of households which included the modules a question on migrations and remittances. The results of this analysis showed interesting features. The first is logically in the questionnaires, the questions on remittances are always related with the presence of a lacking member of the household. However, the results of of the questions show that the household can receive remittances without this condition. The second interesting issue is as follows. When we integrate a model on a multi-purpose national survey, as a rule, we meet the members of the household who are absent for 12 months a year, that is uh, or more that is related to methodology as we use constant mi permanent migrants that might be important to do the relation with their country of origin and uh, with the study of remittances and thirdly the structure of uh, spending remittances the wording of that question uh, based on countries uh, that carry out specialized surveys or use the models of national surveys the formulation is quite different and thus it is difficult to compare the date received. And these, we focused the harmonized model on these three specific features and it looks in such a way that we enclose the model of migrations and remittances, but they are subdivided, they are not related between itself and 
and it is not planned to use one model depending on the other. There is an additional model of uh, permanent immigrants. And finally, harmonized model offers to use classifier of individual consumption by households based on purposes, which are used in the uh, surveys of their budgets of the household to unify the uh, uh, list of the prompts uh, to the work or uh, to the question of spending remittances. That uh, harmonized model was tested in Tajikistan in 2019 in the course of national survey. The full version of question and detailed description can be found on the site of UNC. As to uh, the block transboundary uh, cross border remittances, these are such novelties that were applied to it. First, harmonized model module makes it possible to separate the financial wishes of the migrants and financial behavior of the members of the households in terms of received remittances. Besides, we use the questions from harmonized model and we can compare the level of welfare of the households depending on the monetary remittances, not only on the availability of a migrant in the family. And uh, finally, Hamas approach uh, makes it possible to reveal the counter flows or remittances, which uh, during crisis are quite interesting as a consequence of migration processes. The next project, which we are going to discuss, collection of data on migration in the countries of UN ECE during pandemic. It was realized in 2020, last October by uh, UNEC, they initiated online questioning among the national statistic offices. 25 countries participated in it and they answered a short questionnaire. We wanted to know what alternative da data sources were used uh, during the period, what new methods of collecting data were applied, how the offices responded to the request of the government and the public concerning the data that show the impact of COVID pandemic on different spheres of life was what are the tasks and difficulties arise and how they could cope with them, including administrative difficulties. And we determined that despite the fact that data collection in most cases and the publication of data were without significant delays, some countries noted a concern due to the lower quality of the data because in most cases, this was uh, related with the remote interviewing method that was used in half uh, of uh, the questionnaires. Thus, uh, there was a refusal of the respondents. They said that uh, that method of questioning was not customary for them. Really, some countries quickly respond and responded and that uh, to that situation and in certain cases they uh, just uh, saw uh, change the sources of data for compilation of statistics on foreign migration and migration quite important was the experience of the uk canada and the usa for 2020 for october of course uh, very few departments could include the model or special questions concerning the impact of pandemic. But there is a very interesting foreign experience that is worth of attention. For instance, the USA in April 2020, they launched the survey, uh, it's called the PAP survey, as a result of collaboration of several uh, departments. The questions uh, cover certain spheres of life, and they also use the method of online questioning. Of course, such specialized uh, surveys uh, as of 2020 uh, were quite rare in UNEC uh, countries. Other departments uh, try to monitor the situation and to track the situation based on different available data or indicator, mainly focusing on the labor market entrepreneurship and if possible, they published uh, urgent statistics about the purpose of arrival, about non-citizens or citizens when it was possible. Assessing the le uh, lessons of pandemic, we can state that a great role was played by the possibility to use alternative data sources. And in this respect, quite helpful was the established international cooperation in the sphere of data exchange 
besides the use of remote methods of questioning appeared to be not always successful that revealed the necessity of additional work on that a process to adapt the procedures to the remote format and to have the work not only with the interviewed person with the respondent and of course quite uh, topical is the question of uh, investigating the impact of pandemic so we can revise the model including the specific question concerning the impact of pandemic and finally this year the work on analyzing the impact of pandemic on immigration immigrants members of their families was actualized recently the resulting assessments of the world bank were published for the model of remittances in 2020 that happened in may 2021 despite a pessimistic forecast of the previous year the resulting assessment appeared to be only 1.6 percent so the remittances were quite stable to coronavirus and our region europe and central asia suffered most of all the greatest drop was recorded in the second quarter of 2021 and uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan suffered most of all. And against this background, there is a question, what is the role in our region with the lowest cost uh, of remittances was played by the positive factor that appeared to be quite significant in other uh, regions. I mean, uh, digitization of remittances. Uh, we studied that question under the project on international organization of migration that covered Russia and uh, countries of Central Asia, we analyzed the ecosystem of digital remittances, infrastructure, market, marketplace, financial integration of immigrants and family members. For instance, we studied the practices of financial behavior in terms of remittances of migrants in Russia and in Kazakhstan. We asked about the availability of the banking card, whether they use it for uh, remittance of money to their motherland, what method they chose and what method they preferred. Similar questions were asked to recipients of their monetary remittances, whether they had a bank card, what payment system uh, is that card using national, international, whether they received monetary remittances uh, to their uh, card. There was a question to assess the counter flows because uh, there were interesting data. As a result, we managed to see a very significant difference uh, between the practices of digitization of remittances in Russia and Kazakhstan. Thus, in these countries, there are certain features concerning financial integration of migrants, namely the access to the services of formal financial sector. It should be noted that in cases when migrants had a banking card, were, were deeper integrated into the financial sector. This circumstance made it possible to retain the incoming flow of remittances uh, to the amendment during pandemic. On the other hand, where uh, the preferable uh, type of remittances was informal personally through friends in cash, the channels of sending, the channels of transfer, primary channel uh, was closed during the pandemic. We also saw that as to recipients, there is a preference and practice of getting remittances in cash. This is due to certain circumstances. One of them is, for instance, a preferred currency of remittances, uh, cards of the national payment system do not make it possible to get uh, remittances in foreign currency. And important factors that we managed to reveal what the factors uh, interfering with financial integration of migrants in the countries of residence, non-confidence to the banks, problems with documents and other circumstances, including low awareness about the national banking card that it can be used for remittances. Summing up the results on the three projects that I analyzed briefly, we can formulate the tasks that are quite topical today concerning the collection of data on migration and remittances. Because the task of harmonizing approaches is quite topical now. 
we have to take into account the context of pandemic and possible repeated lockdowns. We have to think about it, providing for the situation when it would be necessary uh, to switch to remote methods of questioning and to shift uh, the uh, time limits for collecting the public and publication data. Question of financial literacy and integration uh, should uh, be the focus in the course of national questionnaire, questioning that are carried out. And thus a question with digitization of remittances, impact of pandemic via the aspect of digitization is highly important. It reflects the changing habits, behavior of habits, not only of migrants, but all the people in general. It can be easily done when we add the question about the method of receiving and sending the remittances. And in general, the task of questioning and sample surveys, regular sample surveys included into migration, around migration and remittances, are not to get precise data, but to reveal the uh, most important relations between migration, financial integration, financial behavior of migrants, family members, and levels of households that directly or indirectly participate in migration processes. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Anna. Now I would like to add that sample surveys of households are, in fact, the only source of data in our region using which we can not measure the extent of labor migration or general migration, but we can study certain sections because the administrative sources, unfortunately, do not reflect certain essential aspects and consequences of temporary and long-term labor migration. I have requests to representatives of the countries that are most often positioned as uh, countries that give away migrants and the countries that have accumulated a great experience of sample surveys of households with questions on labor migrations. Will you please discuss your experience and raise certain questions that might be interesting to all of us? Please, Abdulli, probably you will. The Statistics Committee, I'm happy to see my colleagues at a distance, but it is very pleasant. I would like to tell you about the experience uh, of statistics of the Republic of Tajikistan, questions of migration from different sources, uh, administrative sources and questionnaires on uh, households, population census studies on the labor force. And in the last years we started started under the project of UNEC uh, to implement the questions on harmonized model on uh, survey of the households in 2012. The questions for migration, uh, particular labor migration, is an acute question for the Republic of Tajikistan as a republic that gives away labor migrants to other countries, particularly the Russian Federation. And the study of that question for our country is of great significance, particularly for getting more precise information concerning the flows of labor migrants to other countries. And the statistical agencies in all the studies on the labor force carried out in our countries, implemented the module for assessing and measuring the level of labor migrants, uh, the, the number of labor migrants and the labor forces that was conducted in 2004, 2009, and 2016, as well as the question of migration that was deeply studied in the three last censuses of the population. They were uh, conducted in 20, uh, 2010, 2020 in our country. As has been already noted, despite such a situation with the COVID-19 pandemic, the Republic of Tajikistan in 2020 carried out the census from the 1st to the 15th of October. We had some the questions added to the 
uh, questionnaires on the population census that is a standard questionnaire developed together with our Belarusian Belarusian colleagues and one year before they carried out the census in 2019 I also worked jointly with uh, uh, colleagues from the statistical committee of the sales uh, we included the questions concerning place of both uh, re uh, citizenship as well as temporary residents at the uh, recipient countries as uh, well as foreign citizens who uh, temporarily live in the republic of tajikistan the questionnaire on the census also had the question concerning migration during the intercentral period starting from October 2010 to 2020. Now, we're working on the information collected about the population census, and I'd like to note that for the first time, similar to the Republic of Belarus, we uh, had the census of population using three methods we collected the information using P tablet species uh, for the population living in rural areas traditionally we collected the information starting with uh, 2019 as i already mentioned during the integrated survey of households under the project OUNEC, we implemented, we added four additional uh, questions uh, on the surveys of households to get more detailed information concerning disaggregation of the households uh, to determine the level of welfare, or welfare of the households with migrants or without migrants to what extent migration affected the level of welfare of our population. And in that questionnaire, we had the questions concerning the uh, countries uh, from which the migrants arrived and uh, the question concerning the returning migrants, the questions of uh, permanent migrations. And we also uh, added a question concerning the cross-border remittances, including ingoing and outgoing remittances. Besides the result of that investigation, that survey in 2019, uh, we submitted it to UNESC concerning the final decision concerning propagation of the results of that question. Very interesting information was received concerning disaggregation of the households, which had migrants, permanent migrants, as well as migrants uh, who are returning, and households which don't have migrants. What is the effect of the remittances on the level of the welfare of these uh, households? Ultimately, well, short of time. One minute and a half, please. I can discuss in detail the work that was done at the statistical office on the study of households. In 2020, unfortunately, there was pandemic and we couldn't collect more detailed information on the investigation of the households since according to the plans we passed on to the new method of collecting the data on the surveys of the, uh, the households using tablet PCs, also used integrated model uh, on the investigating the households. We also have changed, according to the recommendation of the World Bank, the sample and all these novelties which were implemented in 2020 unfortunately were implemented during the spread of the pandemic and there were certain delays with collecting data in two quarters after which after in our country the propagation of pandemic was uh, announced starting from april until august we could 
collect uh, the data on the households. Uh, we have a ESTO, the harmonized model at the moment. I think we're going to use this module in future. And the time limits for collecting the information will be decided on later as to how regularly are we going to collect that data, the data during uh, surveys of household. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Abduvali. I would like very much to hear the uh, experts from the statistical offices of Armenia and Kyrgyzstan. I know that these countries have a very uh, good history and experience of sample surveys of households. Please, experts from Armstad and Statistical Committee of Kyrgyzstan, please make their contribution to this session. Armenia, Karine, anyone? Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'm happy to see all of you. We have the experience of Uh, surveys of households. Uh, with a very uh, short questionnaire on migration. Using that model, we collect the, the data on those individuals who, during the period of survey, were not present in the country at the time of their absence, the cause of their absence. And if we have some new family members that also arrived to the country, immigrants and immigrants, that gives us a possibility of assessing the situation following the international standards because the administrative sources do not give such a possibility for assessing the immigrants and emigrants. That survey makes it possible for us to see the immigrants, uh, how long they were absent. And similarly, if they're absent, uh, they send the remittances to the country and uh, some information was uh, published by us. In the uh, publication, Poverty Snapshot, thus we can assess the situation, but we know that for assessing migrants, we also need uh, to, to assess labor migrants. We also have to prepare our questions and to add them to the questionnaires. I believe that as for labor force survey, we are also working at the uh, Department of Labor Statistics and probably in near future will supplement uh, the information that is already available to us. That was brief information. My apology. Thank you very much, Karina. Just for the information of all the attendees, I would like to tell you that unfortunately, Rebecca Conso, for the reason unknown to us, hasn't joined the conference. So these 10 minutes can be used for continue this session and for the Q&A session uh, uh, to the previous speakers. Statistical Committee of Kyrgyzstan, can you add anything concerning the survey? Rima? Then, if possible, I will ask Anna. Very interesting work on harmonized model. As far as I understand, this is mainly aimed for at the donor countries, donors of labor migration. What can be said about a survey, similar survey? Is it possible to conduct it in recipient countries such as Russia and Kazakhstan? I mean, our region. What is the specific feature? What recommendations can be provided? Please, and if possible, thank you very much for your question. 
in order to develop such number such set of questions that can be used also in the recipient question and question of the uh, countries of the departure with uh, departure we try to formalize uh, and to harmonize uh, the wordings uh, the, uh, there are specific features when we speak about the respondents how many respondents are covered by the question if we uh, carry out the question in the recipient countries when we discussed it with representatives of statistical offices, when we discussed this harmonized model, most of the questions and difficulties of methodology were uh, coming from the recipient country. In Russia, for instance, this is more difficult to carry on such uh, to carry such a survey. As far as I remember from the answers uh, so of representatives of Rostat, it is possible in principle and there is an interest to it, but to a lesser extent than in the countries who are uh, uh, sending the migrants. I think that if we want to increase the interest to the theme, we can focus on the remittances because remittances are no less significant for the country of the residents of migrant. We uh, speak about the economic contribution of migrants uh, in the country of residence, not only the country from which uh, they have departed. It is important to have a more complete picture about what migrants is, are doing, what is their financial behavior in Russia, what instruments they use, and the integration into the financial sector and increase of financial literacy as shown by the last project on digitization provokes great interest of the financial regulator in our case of the bank of russia which now is realizing the state program of increasing financial literacy of the population in general they are interested in how they can also incorporate non-residents into the program because that is the economy of the country of the state of migrants will win due to that answer the question not only methodologically but strategically i would like to stress the strategic importance of including the question of uh, migration and remittances into the question i think rima chilembaeva you take the floor thank you very much in fact uh, my colleague had to make some presentation but due to some technical problems she couldn't join us so she asked us uh, me to do it tomorrow we're going to have a sample survey we had some technical problems tamara taipova from kirgizia statistical office we'll find the computer right now okay the chief specialist of statistical office i'm dealing with survey of the labor force the main way that the responsible body is the service office of migration under the government of a republic and uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is dealing with the question of migration. The main body providing the information about the migrants for Kyrgyz Republic is the Statistical Committee of Kyrgyz Republic, which conducts annual integrated survey of households. And at the same time, uh, the survey is also conducted during several past years. The main uh, numbers of people uh, beyond uh, the Kyrgyz Republic is uh, 230, 250 uh, thousand uh, persons who live our country. These are uh, mainly men and people who live in rural areas. As to the labor migrants, we have analyzed them. Mostly these are young people uh, aged 25, 29. Many of these are youth working in trade, in construction, in hotels and restaurants. And the time of stay in the territory of the country, of the recipient countries from three to 12 months. Many 
our citizens who leave our country are coming to the Russian Federation uh, more than uh, 96 percent in uh, Kazakhstan and Turkey. As to the uh, migrant stocks that are uh, to the territory, uh, to the territory of uh, migrants, the responsible body is the state service of migration, state office of migration under the government of Kyrgyz Republic and annually they regulate the process and attract the workforce uh, forming the quotas, which each year, according to the law on the external labor migration is determined by the government of Kyrgyz Republic, taking into account the state interests and the situation at the internal state market at the domestic market lately the citizens that came to the territory of kyrgyz republic were many citizens from the chinese people's republic and from turkey many this is brief information about the situation with labor migration in kyrgyz republic we also wanted to take into account the foreign citizens who arrived from other countries to the territory of Kyrgyzstan who are not taken into account. Thank you very much. But I think that such questions and administrative sources should be discussed in a special seminar because in that field in our country, we have related a lot of problems and they cannot be uh, just uh, discussed within this seminar. We have to deal a conference or certain so, seminar. Thank you very much. Now, I suggest it will pass on to the next session that will be as interesting as the previous session. That session will be dealing with the regional and global generalization of data and harmonization of methodology. And the first speaker will be respected Jean Christophe Dumont, head of the International Migration Division of the Directorate for Employment, Labor and Social Affairs Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. He will have a joint presentation with the expert of the division, Philippe Hervé. Jean-Christophe, uh, please. Uh, good afternoon, my apologies. Uh, uh, that I speak uh, Russian. English. Uh, so my name is Jean-Christophe Dumont. I'm the uh, head of the International Migration Division. Can I share my presentation? I see the host uh, should me should give me the, the right to do so. Yes, you have right. No, it's. <clears throat> I I believe that. Uh, oh, no, it's good. It's good now. Okay, super. Thank you. Um, do you see the presentation full screen? <laughs> Yes, we do. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, yes, the um, the OECD is uh, thirty eight uh, countries. Unfortunately, none of the origin, uh, but has been working on migration for a very long time, more than forty years, and for about ten years, we're very happy to have a uh, uh, Russian Federation represented by Olga in our expert group on 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 migration. Uh, very briefly, uh, what we do at the OECD, uh, so we monitor migration and immigration uh, trends and policies. We do that not only for OECD countries, but we also do that for Asia, with uh, covering about 20 countries, and for Latin America, and we're starting uh, a project with uh, IOM on Africa. So certainly this region remains a black spot for us. But we hope we can share in this presentation some of the uh, practices that, that we have been implementing in the OECD for the past decades. Other part of our work uh, concerns uh, the economic impact of migration, the challenge of uh, labor market and social integration of immigrants and their children, the uh, link uh, with countries of origin and analysis of uh, migration policies. We also do a, a, an annual report for the G20, which obviously covers uh, Russia. But uh, let me now hand over to my 
colleague Philippe Hervé, who will uh, tell you more about uh, uh, ways to measure migration flows in the OECD. Philippe, to you. Yeah. Thank you, Jean Christophe. Uh, thank you for having us, and apologies for not speaking at all Russian. Um, so, what, uh, what we do, how does the uh, OECD measure migration flows? Um, the OECD uses uh, flow data for several purposes. We use some detailed national statistics for long term analysis, uh, studies on immigration, but we also uh, produce harmonized data on permanent migration flows by category uh, to facilitate international comparisons for policy purposes. Among our sources, there is an annual data collection uh, that Olga knows, uh, but we also make use uh, of the OECD expert group on migration, which includes, of course, OECD countries, but some uh, non-OECD countries such as Russia. And uh, as Jean-Christophe said, we also have a number of uh, small data collections through, uh, by our regional networks in Asia and in Latin America. And uh, finally, our main publication is the International Migration Outlook, which is annual. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, can you hear me? Laura, следующий слайд, пожалуйста. I am trying. Next but... slide, please. Just. Oh. But don't you share your screen? Uh, oh yes, it's okay. Thank Work. you. <laughs> here it is. Here it is. Uh, here the uh, migration flows uh, uh, examples and uh, of how we use national data. Uh, detailed by nationality with uh, the two objectives, uh, the, which are uh, one, to establish consistent series over time on uh, migration flows, and uh, second objective, uh, to uh, be able to analyze the pattern of uh, migration flows by country of destination and by country of origin. And you can see Russia is included in the bottom table among the top countries of origin of migration flows to OECD. Next slide, please. Thank you. The uh, permanent immigrants, uh, this is the description of uh, how we at OECD define permanent migration. So first, the scope, it's about uh, regulated flows, uh, as well as free mobility uh, as uh, in the European Union. Uh, it's by a broad category of migration, work, family, uh, accompanying family of workers and humanitarian. Uh, concerning the definition, we include uh, persons who receive a first permit that is either uh, a permanent permit or is uh, indefinitely renewable, very easily renewable. There can be sometimes uh, little conditions, but uh, not uh, major ones. Uh, this corresponds to uh, physical entry. We also include in the permanent, uh, among permanent migrants, um, person who were uh, who had were having a temporary permit holding a temporary permit and changing uh, to a permanent uh, permit this does not correspond to a physical entry uh, this is a change of status and uh, as i said we also include uh, persons uh, who immigrants within uh, free uh, circulation areas and in practice, we apply uh, the one-year criterion and uh, excluding ex international students. Next slide, please. Now, uh, this is a chart on what we are able to uh, present on migration flows. And uh, you can see we have been able to include only a number of countries in, the, in this uh, section, in this chart. 
Russia is not one of the countries included here, but we would be uh, very happy to collaborate with you, uh, notably in the view of the G20 publication, where Russia is fully included in all table, of course. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is a chart on temporary labor migrants. Uh, we also don't have the uh, Russia here, uh, notably because we are not sure about the patents. Uh, but here, as you can see, there are huge variations. Some OECD countries have huge numbers. Uh, it is very hard to compare across countries, notably because of the variations uh, in the duration of permits. To give you an example, uh, for the posted workers, uh, in Luxembourg, the average duration of uh, the contract of a posted worker is 10 days, and in Spain, it's 10 months. So there's a lot of discrepancy. But we try to uh, solve that by uh, adding uh, other international students and asylum seekers. We try to take into account uh, the contribution of these categories of temporary migrants. Um, and uh, Russia is still not on this one, but sorry, uh, the, just to mention, we have data on, on Russia for both uh, asylum seeker and students in the statistical annex. Sorry, next slide. Yeah. Um, so then a solution in order to uh, be able to evaluate the full impact of uh, temporary migration on the labor market is to include uh, not only the full year equivalent uh, for temporary labor migrants, but also to add the contribution of these uh, other categories like asylum seekers and students. And in this work that you see here uh, that we did last year, the result is that there is an estimated uh, for uh, 5.4 million full year equivalent workers. You can see it uh, at the bottom in the red box. Um, this is a very significant uh, number uh, to give you an order of comparison. Uh, the OECD receives every year uh, 5 million permanent migrants. So if you take into account that right, it's another 5 million uh, migrant, labor migrant here. And uh, now for our work on migrant stocks, integration, and the uh, rest, I will give the floor back to Jean-Christophe. Thank you. Spasiba. Thank you, uh, Philippe. Uh, indeed, as you, you've seen, uh, part of the work of the OECD is to try to make sense of this international comparison. And this is challenging on flows uh, because flows are composed of very different categories uh, with very, very different duration of stay, uh, different purpose, and also flows don't always correspond to entries, might uh, have people renewing their permits or people changing from one status to, to the other. So we do that for OECD countries, we'd be very happy to uh, work with you uh, to do similar analysis uh, for your region if there is any interest. Obviously, when it comes to stocks, this is uh, much easier. Uh, and and uh, we, we've heard a lot about the role of, of censuses and, and we use this data source in two ways. Uh, first of all, to uh, estimate the, the share of immigrants in, in OECD destination countries. I will not present that, uh, but I will present you the mirror statistics that we produce in this database, which is called uh, DIOC. The DIOC database is the compilation of censuses uh, from all destination countries that we can uh, gather. Uh, and it, it compiles information by place of birth. So it was done initially uh, for the years, uh, for the, the round of uh, the 2000 round of census. Uh, it was uh, replicated uh, with uh, 2010, 11 uh, round of population census. And in between for 2005, 6, 2015, 16, 
we have a smaller data collection which focuses only on OECD countries as destination. But for all these years, what we can do, for example, by aggregating this data is to tell you how many people are born in Tajikistan, were born in Tajikistan and are currently living in OECD countries. We can tell you in which country they are, but we have also more information in this database so that we can tell you uh, their social demographic profile, what they are doing uh, for how long they've been there and which, which sort of jobs they are, uh, uh, they are working on. So uh, I will give you just a, a snapshot about, about this data. It's available on this link. Uh, Dioc database is, is there. Uh, I realized that for many countries in the region, not having Russia as a destination uh, limits the, uh, the utility of this information. Uh, but I can tell you that in the 2000 and 2010 rounds, we do have Russia and Ukraine as destination countries. So this data I hopefully useful for you. And in the uh, using the uh, 2020 round of population censuses, we also hope to be able to include Russia as a destination. But just to give you a snapshot, what we can do with that, uh, this is, uh, uh, for example, useful to estimate the impact of a brain drain. Uh, in total, in the OECD, uh, we have 2.5 million people who were born in the Russian Federation living in the OECD. Almost 60% of them are women. Uh, interesting, because it's much higher than the average share. Uh, and about 42% are tertiary educated. Um, when you compare that to the population of the Russian Federation, uh, it leads us uh, to the estimate that about 2% of the 15 years old plus Russian population is actually living and working in the OECD countries. Uh, for tertiary educated, it's about 3%. These are relatively small numbers, and this is in line with what we see in other big countries of origin. But for example, we've heard the case of Moldova before, in the 2015-16 data for OECD destination country only, so not including Ukraine and Russia, about 22% of the tertiary educated Moldovan population is working in the OECD. These are huge numbers. Uh, for Belarus, it's about 8%. And for Kazakhstan, it's about 7%, etc. You have all this information uh, in this database. What we can do more is that we can uh, 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 zoom into some specific occupation. And here are the data for uh, foreign trained and foreign born doctors and nurses working in the OECD. As you can see, uh, there is about uh, 19, between 18 and 19,000 uh, doctors working in the OECD were born in the Russian Federation. Uh, this comes at uh, the eighth uh, countries of origin for OECD total, obviously far below India and, and Russia, and China, sorry, uh, but still uh, comparable to the number for Poland, for example. So that's quite outstanding, I believe. Uh, for nurses, it's quite interesting, about 41,000 uh, nurse uh, working in the OECD were actually born in the Russian Federation. But what you can see here is contrary to the doctors, there is a huge discrepancy between the number of foreign trained and foreign born nurses. Meaning that if uh, Russian trained doctors uh, manage to get their qualification recognized, maybe after some additional training, et cetera, in, in the OECD, for nurses, this is much more difficult. They have basically to retrain themselves in destination countries. It's only about 11,000 uh, foreign trained nurses uh, in, or nurses trained in the Russian Federation who are currently working in the OECD. Again, we could go deeper uh, in, in, in this data, but it just to give you a snapshot of what we can do with that, mirror statistics that we have for OECD countries and for uh, uh, population census years for about 100 uh, destination countries around the world. Let me now turn to another issue that we, on which we are focusing at the OECD. It's the monitoring of the economic and social outcome of immigrants and their children. So it's not only that we count the number of people entering and leaving, it's not only that we count the stocks, 
uh, but we try to go deeper into how people fare in the destination countries. A flagship publication here is Settling In, Indicators of Immigrant Integration. It has 74 indicators uh, in, in multiple dimensions that cover employment, education skills, living condition, poverty, socioeconomic integration, etc. Uh, so uh, just to give you a, a test of what we can do with this sort of information, uh, when you are really able to put the information together on a comparable basis, it sometimes reveals very fascinating stories. As this graph shows, the difference in terms of employment between foreign-born and native-born by uh, tertiary educated and, and low educated migrants or native born. So what the graph shows is that for low educated, the gap varies a, a lot between countries. Actually in the United States, this is very outstanding. The immigrants have very high unemployment rate, employment rate, sorry, compared to native born, low educated, uh, non-migrant. Uh, but that's not the story really. The story is uh, with the dots, because the dots shows the difference in terms of employment rate for tertiary educated immigrants with native born. And what you can see is despite the fact that OECD countries are all competing to attract highly skilled workers, they're doing a very bad job at integrating them in their labor market across all OECD countries. Tertiary educated immigrants have lower employment rate than native born tertiary educated. And sometimes it's huge gap, like in France or Germany, it goes up to 15 percentage point between the two groups. So because we are able to bring this information together in a single graph, because we are able to have a common definition and, and really uh, to compare uh, the, uh, the variable here, we can reveal a common, uh, a common challenge for all uh, countries, which is about uh, obviously bringing back to the question of recognition of qualification and the over education of uh, of uh, immigrants with tertiary education qualification and so on and so forth. This is again, uh, an exercise that we will do now for Latin America. I think in your region, there would be a lot to learn from such an exercise. Let me now end uh, with, with uh, another uh, thing that uh, uh, is a joint uh, venture between UN DESA, IOM and OECD. And some of you uh, may have participated to previous edition. We have launched in 2018, what we call the International Forum on Migration Statistics, which directly speaks to objective one of a global compact on migration to improve uh, information system on, on, on migration. Uh, the idea is to bring together in a community all the producers and users of migration statistics uh, and, and to exchange on, on, on practices, uh, innovate, innovative practices and challenges uh, that everybody face uh, in front of his desk and computer. Uh, we have organized the first meeting in 2018 in Paris. IOM organized the second meeting in Cairo. There was more than 700 people who participated. So just to give you a hand up, uh, the next meeting will be in 2022. It will be in the fall, November, uh, October. We, we're not sure about the exact date yet. Uh, soon you will receive inf more information about the call for papers and call for sessions. And we certainly welcome a lot of contribution from uh, your region because you have, uh, as you could see uh, throughout the presentation already, a lot to share on migration uh, uh, analysis and migration uh, data collection. So it will be in New York or Mexico. This is not uh, firmly defined yet, but just wanted to, again, uh, send a call for everyone to contribute. Uh, and we look forward to maybe exchanging with you in this context or, or otherwise. Thank you very much. Большое спасибо, Жан Кристоф. Блестящая презентация. Вы уложились почти вовремя. Я хочу добавить, что... Thank you very much, Jean Christophe. We are all, almost on time to add the wonderful, uh, to add the wonderful analysis of using mirror statistics for Russia, particularly, and for many uh, uh, countries that give away my, uh, migrants of Eastern Europe. This data of OSD is the only source for such full-fledged study of immigration because as to the national sources we can't cannot do this we have an underestimation 
uh, of the scope of the immigrant flows and their structural characteristics. So to the students and to our colleagues, uh, we recommend to proceed from such databases for using the method of mirror statistics and the database of OSD is one of the best one. Then so these are countries that are mainly the countries of destination for immigrants from Russia, for instance. So I suggest that all of you would use the brilliant method and demonstrated its advantages and this data. Thank you very much once again, Jan, Christophe and Philippe for your wonderful presentation. Thank you, dear colleagues, allow me to uh, come to the next item of our agenda and to give the floor to Carla Rojas Paz, Office of the International Organization for Migration, Global and, uh, and uh, Migration Data Analysis Center, uh, GDMAC. She will speak about MOM project targeted, not only integration of statistics, but at popularization of the information of what types of uh, migration statistics exist, what are the data sources, and uh, to promote that knowledge to the broad range of users. Carla, please. Thank you, Olga, for that introduction. Um, and thank you so much for the invitation. My Just name is Olga. Carla. I have to switch to continue. Uh, thank you, I have switched to the version. Thank you, please. Thank you, Olga, for that introduction, and thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carla Rojas Pass, and as Olga mentioned, I am with IOM's uh, Global Migration Data Analysis Center. Um, today, I will be presenting uh, mainly the project that I work on, which is the Global Migration Data Portal. And um, thank you also to the interpreters behind the scenes. If I do speak too fast, please stop me, which is very important. Um, as I mentioned, I, I work primarily, uh, I will be presenting the Global Migration Data Portal. Um, but before I even begin, I'm just going to explain a little bit about, uh, I know most of you know what IOM is and what IOM does, but perhaps very few of you have um, uh, know what the Global Migration Data Analysis Center is. Um, so, and by the way, when I say the Global Migration da Data Analysis Center, I will uh, often say GIMDAC, so just so you know that, um, that that's what I, I'm referring to. And just let me share my slides with you briefly. If you can't see it, please do let me know. Yes, it's okay. Perfect, thank you. So the Global Migration Data Analysis Center is essentially IOM's data hub, and we're based in Berlin, Germany, where our staff around 30 people or so, and we've grown the last year or two. And we have three main lines of work. The first one is knowledge management, which basically we help uh, a variety of different stakeholders understand uh, international migration data. And the project that I'll be presenting to you is one example of that. Another line of work is capacity building, and here we provide uh, training to a variety of different stakeholders, including IOM member states. And we uh, do trainings on uh, migration definitions, migration uh, concepts, data collection. We also do work on disaggregating um, uh, data by migratory status. A lot of our work at the moment is um, is centered in Africa, although we have other places with the main work of our capacity building right now is in Africa. And the other final line of work is data collection and analysis. Uh, there are a few projects that we do that do collect uh, data. One, perhaps you've heard of it, it's called the Missing Migrants Project. And we have uh, colleagues all over the world who are collecting data on migrants who have gone missing during their migration journeys. There's another project that perhaps you also might know, which is um, the Migration uh, Global Indicators Project, which collects a variety of different data on, I believe, if I remember correctly, around 90 uh, indicators related to migration uh, governance. So those are just sort of an example of, of what we do. So as I mentioned, um, I should say 
I'm going to be presenting the global migration data portal. I am not a statistician. I have a background in uh, in research, and I also have a background in in uh, journalism. So this whole concept and 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 talk about dissemi uh, dissemination of migration data is incredibly fascinating to me, and I will speak to you about it from uh, not a statistical point of view, but mostly a communication point of view. Um, so I will answer two main questions since we were asked to uh, present very briefly. And the first one is, why does dissemination of migration data matter? So it's a very simple question, but it's a very important question to ask. And it's a very important question to dissect because there are very, uh, there's various sub questions related to that important question. And the second question I will answer in this presentation is what types of migration data and information do the portal, um, uh, does the portal disseminate? Um, sorry, most of my presentation will actually be a tour of the portal, um, which I will show share with you recently and we've done some you know, exciting things with some of the visualizations so I'm excited to present with you uh, those today because they're fairly new we were uh, launched a few things last week so why does the dissemination of migration data matter so here what you see is um, it's it's not a an IOM uh, visual but it's a it's a visual that's called the data value chain, and perhaps you've heard you've used you've heard this uh, word data value chain, which is um, you hear it mostly in the business world, where you uh, take basically some sort of raw material and you turn it into a good. So, Open Data Watch and Data Two X have basically used that idea of the data value chain and applied it to migration data. And what you see here are the different stages of, uh, or yeah, stages or activities, let's say, that data go through from collection, publication, uptake, and impact. So when you move from the left to the right, you're adding in value. And every step is connected and every step is, is important. Um, here in the middle, since this talk is, uh, is focused on, on dissemination, you see sort of the, the connecting point between collection and publication and uptake and impact. So this is, is an extremely important point. Uh, a lot of the times, sometimes we focus on what are the data that we should put we should collect, uh, what are they, uh, how, how should we collect, et cetera. We focus more on the collection part, but we also need to focus on the dissemination part because if you have the most wonderful collection methods, most wonderful IT systems, et cetera, even harmonized data, you have collect all the data possible in the world, disaggregated by all the possible various uh, variables, if you do not disseminate and you do not disseminate effectively, then people really won't use your data. Um, one thing also that's important that's not mentioned in this, uh, in this infographic is obviously this idea of trust. Because even if you do every step correctly, if your end users of the data do not trust the data for whatever reason, they won't use the data. So as I mentioned, it's not enough just to disseminate data, but it's really important to disseminate it effectively. And so this is just a few of the considerations or questions that you as national statistical officers or governments can ask yourself on how to uh, disseminate effectively. And it's, there's many other questions, but seem some are, these are some of the key questions. So if I have data, what type of format should I disseminate it in? This is an important question in part because as you already know, people really now consume and use data in different formats. Yes, it's still important to have, uh, you know, uh, data programs, data in table forms uh, or whatever sort of form, uh, you know, that you use in that sense more, uh, 
more data that's not, let's say, user friendly, that's important. But people now are really changing the way that they use data and that they understand it. So there's different questions that you should be asking for. So if I want to communicate certain data to, let's say, a journalist, probably the table format would not be the best format to use. If I need to um, communicate to journalists, perhaps an infographic would be better. If I need to communicate my country's data to a policymaker, probably that table format would not be a good format to communicate that data. And maybe perhaps some sort of brief policy, uh, some policy brief with data visualizations or even better, something interactive. Um, so really you have to think about what format, but then who are you trying to get to use your data? Another consideration is what sort of channels for distribution? Will you be using something that's online, for example? Will, be, will you be using some database that's only, um, only accessible for certain types of users? These are things really that, you know, there's no perfect answer to it, it's, but it's based on your end user and what your, uh, what your goals are for that data. How often do you disseminate data? This is also something to consider because we know that data can be very uh, untimely and the COVID-19 pandemic really showed us that that's the case when we, you know, in countries we're looking for, for example, what the impact of COVID-19 was on migrants, we learned very quickly that number one, either that data was not available or number two, that data were just very um, uh, old and, and needed to be collected. And the last question that I have here is what languages you will disseminate. So I mentioned this because later you'll see in the presentation, but again, depending on your context and what your goals are and what impact you wanna have with your data, it really could be an important question to answer if uh, you have a variety of different users that speak uh, not your country's languages. In the portal, uh, we have in the past three years or so have um, uh, translated basically in, in four different languages. And we've learned that people really do not always want to see or can, um, can read or want to have access to migration data and information in English, for example. So we have the migration data uh, on the portal and information available in English, Spanish, French, and, and German. So what types of data and information are available on the portal? So I will switch now um, for a second and I will share um, the actual site. And hopefully, let me make it just a tad bit bigger because I know it can be difficult to see. Hopefully that's okay. So what you hear, what you see here is the landing page of the migration data portal. And the portal is essentially an online site uh, for a variety of different users, including national statistical officers, journalists, policymakers, any, anyone really who wants to know about migration data. And um, we have a variety of different types of information. Um, I will start first by showing you the most recent information, which was a dashboard that we launched last week. And um, there might be a lag, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, hopefully you can see that. So here on our dashboard, we offer three types of different information that you can visualize. And uh, you have international data here on the left side, you have, um, you can compare indicators by geographical scope. You can also compare any more than one type of indicators. And then we have our most recent, which is the pilot project where we visualize national data. Um, the international data dashboard has over 80 different indicators and it's from, uh, it's taking data sets and visualizing data sets from 20 different data providers. Excuse me, please. Uh, did you try to um, switch to the migration data portal website or you are just talking about it? This is, yes, yeah, sorry. This is the live version. I, I'm not using the screenshots. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, just screenshots to be uh, on the clear side. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, sorry, I will be sharing the live version. This is where I, can you see that? No, we, do, we see only your presentation. Ah, okay. So let me, sorry, that was you, my. You just switch your screen. Yes, yes. Right. Let me do that. Yes. Just uh, quickly close that at that. Okay. Um, okay. Can you see that now? Yes, we do. Thank yes. you. Okay, great. Sorry about that. So as I was saying, um, here you see basically a dashboard provides uh, different types of migration data and information visualized. The first dashboard that you have, you have access to visualizations of international data. We have over 80 different indicators ranging um, from human trafficking data, migration stock data, refugee data, asylum seeker data, et cetera, et cetera. It's from 20 different international data providers, including some of the data from our OECD colleagues, UNDESA. And so I'll just show you one brief example to see what you can do with the visualizations on here. Um, so you start here, as I said, more than 80 different indicators. Uh, I'll just choose international migration stock, the percentage of total population. So you choose basically an indicator here and you see which one you've chosen here. Um, and then you go, you can basically filter uh, the data sets. And this is what the map is, is visualizing every time you, you click on something. And I will, I can choose from a country, sub-region or region. I will just type in Russia. And then in this case, we have the most recent uh, international migrant stock data from the US from 2020. And so basically the map will visualize that that uh, that data, that data set that's available um, behind the seat, so to speak. And you see 8% um, of international, uh, and 8% of the population in Russia are international migrants. So again, any international, over 80 different international uh, migration data indicators are available to visualize. Beyond that, you can scroll down under the map and you can see a variety of different types of visualizations in these graphics. This here, for example, is the trend for the Russian, for Russia, for uh, the migrant stock as a percent of the total population. You can see over the last 20 years, it has not changed much. On the right-hand side, you see the countries with the highest value, um, and this is international. If you keep scrolling, I'm sorry, that should be Russia. I realize, yes, two minutes. <laughs> Russia. Okay. I, I uh, clicked on uh, the UAE. If you keep scrolling, uh, you see more information. You see a variety of different types of key migration statistics. And in addition, a variety of different types of uh, development statistics. So that's just one example. And this is, and then I'll come next to our different. Uh, dashboard here. Here we have, you can now um, compare essentially uh, different countries. Um, you can now compare uh, different um, countries with uh, selected by indicators. So let's say in this case, give me just a second. Okay. So let's say I want to compare, um, again, and I'll do just do with stocks. I can, sh I can uh, select different countries. So let's say I wanted to select Russia. I also wanted to select Belarus. So you see here now I have two countries. Um, I can, it's up to four countries that you can select. So what it essentially does, it's does a visualization in the line chart, um, the, the comparison. So this is pretty handy because a lot of the times uh, either you as a data analyst have to do this sort of analysis, but now with the dashboard, we're, we're able to, to do this. 
The next example I have um, is now a comparison of, of indicators. Um, you can choose basically a variety of different indicators now. So let's say I want to uh, I ask you to come to the. Uh, oh wow, <laughs> that was very quick. So let me and the half, please. Uh, sure. Let me just finish then on this last one. There's a variety of different information on on the portal, but I suppose this probably is the main information. So, um, different indicators. Let's say I want to uh, look at um, again stocks. And then I want to look at immigrant, uh, total immigrants. I could choose to say just for Russia again. Here, what I'm looking at is the different indicators visualized, but just for Russia. And so this is interesting to see. Um, again, you know, you can't really do a full analysis where you're doing causation, et cetera, but um, you can keep clicking on the indicators and see sort of what the migration situation for the different indicators for Russia looks like. So because of time, um, I unfortunately can't show you everything, but I would just like to um, uh, encourage you to, to visit WW and let me just sort of, if I may, please just share the, um, let's see just the website. Hopefully, can you see that? Yes, we do. We, we Perfect. Can. Yeah, so just feel free to uh, send us an email. Just last point, if I may, at the I didn't show you, and again, because of time, we, uh, if you play around on the website, we have a section now on national data. The exciting part of the national data is that you can now see sub-national data. So you can see, for example, immigrant uh, stocks within different uh, uh, provinces, let's say for four different countries. Right now we have pilots. So for example, from Germany, from uh, New Zealand, uh, Switzerland. If your country is interested in joining the pilot project to have some of your national data visualized, please reach out to me. Um, we're very interested in expanding this part of the portal. And I we think it's very useful for policymakers, not just at the federal level, but because it's sub-national uh, uh, information. It's very useful, I think, also for, uh, for governors of, of states or even of mayors. Thank you very much, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Carla. I would like to tell you that this internet resource collects all the possible definitions of immigration and migration. It gives the descriptions of different types of migrations with clear definitions, and it is quite useful even for those uh, who are starters and uh, experts in that field the students so it is uh, just an enlightenment uh, portal and i recommend to the national statisticians and to the uh, scientists uh, to click on this portal because it is constantly uh, constantly being reduced uh, being expanded for understanding the migration statistics that information is highly valuable i think this is one of the most successful projects of IOMA, and I wish you uh, good luck. Thank you very much, Carla. Now I give the floor to Kirill Andreev, expert from the Department on Economic and Social Questions of UN with a presentation. And I hope he will give the name of his presentation, please. Microphones, yes. Please keep within the time limit because we're beyond the time limits already. Yes, we can see everything. So thank you very much for inviting us to this meeting. And I hope you can see my slides now. And my name is Kirill Andreev, and I'm working for Population Division, Department of Economic and Social Affairs, United Nations. And I will provide you with overview of the work we are doing on migrant stocks. So this is the structure of our department. 
И тогда переводчик, да? переводчик должен успевать помедленнее, пожалуйста. This department is commonly known as DESA. DESA located as the United Nations Secretariat and include two divisions. The statistic divisions and population divisions. And this is division they are doing data on migrant stocks. Uh, statistic division is in charge of United Nations demographic yearbook series. It collects, compiles, and disseminates statistics on wide range of demographic topics. The data are collected via questionnaires that are sent annually to the member states. The data from demographic yearbook series are available online, and here is a partial list of tables related to migration. Online data covers data from 1995, but historical data are also available in the database. Uh, the database is not necessarily complete, but you, you cannot find all census because it depends how member states are submitting data to this system. At population division, we are supporting an internal database of empirical migration data. And primary goal of this database is to provide empirical data to the estimates of migrant stocks. So in this respect, our goal of having this database is uh, different from that of statistic division. Uh, the database we are support is more comprehensive and more actively updated. It incorporates data from demographic book series, including historical data, data from OICD, Eurostat, UNSCR, and UNRWA. And to extend possible, we are also collecting micro data for countries that release them but mostly from the wars in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. In addition, we actively collecting data from the website of national statistical offices and by direct inquiries. And the intention here with this database is to get as recent data as possible. So here is the availability of the empirical data in this internal database coming mostly from censuses. Uh, first group of countries shows data on migrant stocks. For last decade, we have data for 129 countries. Out of 235, we are tracking, or slightly more than for the half of the countries. For years from 2000 to 2010, this is green bar, we have data for 156 countries, and for the 90s, for 153 countries. Uh, data by age of migrants are less common. So for the last decade, we have data only for, for 96 countries. And even for fewer countries, the data are available by country of origin. So only for 84 countries for last two decades. And here is the statistic on timeliness of the available data on total migrant stocks. For the last five years, we have data for 70 countries. From 2015, where the last data point in this period. For another 59 countries, we have uh, the last data point between 2010 and 2015. And for the rest 75 countries, the uh, recent data point is before 2010. As mentioned above, the empirical database supported by population division is used mainly for computing estimates of trends in international migrant stocks. And here is the main page of this publication. And here is the link. The estimates on migrant stocks are produced for 235 countries or areas and for years from 1990 or later. They are computed by sex and by five-year age groups, up to age 75 plus. In an ideal case, estimates by country of origin are also computed for 200 or 35 countries. But in reality, it's less because it depends on data availability for particular countries. And estimates by country of origin are not available by age. Once estimates for single countries are produced, we are using them to compute various aggregates, for example, by geographical areas, income, and so on. 
And so also they are used for computing so-called uh, transnational communities now, or commonly known as a diaspora. A uh, few words about the estimation process. For, for identifying migrants, we use the information on country of birth. If information is not available on country of birth, we are using data on citizenship. Census is our primary source of information. For other sources, but other sources like post-sensual estimates or inter-sensual estimates, service administrative data are increasingly used as well for the estimation. Uh, in many countries, the census are believed not capturing the refugees in asylum seekers. In this case, we add in estimates of refugees in asylum seekers provided by UNHCR or UNRWA to the data reported in the census. A little bit more, an adjustment. Uh, frequently, data cannot be used as face value and have to be adjusted. First, if possible, the data are adjusted for census on the count. For a few countries, we also need to make data to be consistent with the estimates of the pop total population. As we also as empirical data are coming in various shapes, we are using a variety of techniques to standardize data by age and by quality. Uh, methods used for estimating trends depends on data available for a particular country. For the countries with two or more data points, we usually use interpolation, extrapolation, or short-term projections. Uh, for countries with one data point, regional growth rates are commonly used. And with data, uh, with, for the country with no data, we are using or imputing trends from the group of similar countries. Uh, for computing age distribution, we use cohort component methods or the age distribution is a group of similar countries. And for countries of origin, for estimating trades by country of origin, so the methods are used are similar to those used for the total migrant stocks, like interpolation, extrapolation, and short-term projects. This is briefly. Our dissemination activities is uh, Excel files, in the highlights report after the revision. We also do in world charts, country profiles, policy briefs, and population facts. And because the data are freely available, so they are distributed on many uh, websites uh, and most probably well known. As you just saw, this is website of the International Organization for Migration. This is a new data portal that they are disseminating now data. This is our uh, the latest highlight report. It was published last uh, year, and uh, I will show some results from it. Analysis of the global trends suggests that the number of international migrants for quite reached about uh, 281 million, up from 173 million in 2000, and 22 million in 2010. And the growth was mostly driven by the growth of migrants in the high-income countries. Uh, nearly two-thirds of all international migrants live now in the high-income countries. This is the bar. Uh, Middle-income countries are your destination of about 31% of the migrants. And uh, relatively few international migrants lived in uh, low-income countries about 4%. Uh, most of the world's migrants live in a small number of countries. In 2020, two thirds of all international migrants were living in just about 20 countries. Uh, the United States of America remained by far the largest country of destination for international migrants with 51 million migrants in 2020, or 18% of the world's total. Germany hosted about 16 million, the second largest, and Saudi Arabia hosted about maybe 13.5 million of international migrants, and Russia about 11 million. As regarding the countries of origin, India was the largest, 
India has the largest transnational community in the world with 18 million persons from the India who are living outside of their country at birth in 2020. Other countries with large diaspora included Mexico, Russian Federation, about 11 million, and China, 10.5 million of people. A little bit about future plans. And now future plans is to continue building and upgrading the empirical database, accompanying archive of the publications and archive of microdata. We are also planning to create internal documentation for each of the countries, upgrade our methodology and produce a software library for doing these estimates. Here is our team from the last revision, uh, leadership and management. And of course, it was built on the work done by previous analysts in the population division. The whole line of work of the on migrant stock started in the 80s under the initiative of the former director of the division, Hannes Lutnik. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and opportunity to present this work. Thank you. Kirill, thank you very much, Kirill. I just want to say uh, as a person who has a good experience of working with this data, not only as uh, using statistics, but as a commentator, possibly you don't know, but after each publication of UN released on the estimates of that contingent of international migrants, at least in the Russian mass media, they start a very uh, well. Uh, extensive company on discussing the number of international migrants in Russia. The people ignore the fact that half of these international migrants have uh, come here before the disintegration of the Soviet Union, and people who have high political uh, uh, position interpret these 11 millions as uh, gastarbeiters who are at the same time in the territory of Russia, ignoring the definitions that was given by you, you on the population division. I regularly met the comments concerning the number of people who were born in Russia who live in other countries. And of course, they forget that many of these are the countries of the former Soviet Union. Quite often, that, uh, the stock of migrants who different uh, meant in different years are interpreted as the people who left the country during the last year. So I would like to ask the Division of Population uh, to provide these releases with additional explanations, probably for you the same uh, just commonplace and surprising, but for the users in Russia, they would be uh, quite important because each time after the next publication, uh, I'm called by the journalists who ask me, uh, ask for explanations, and quite often they publish the comments even without thinking about the figures and what they reflect. And I would like uh, to thank the Division of Population for the great work that you are doing. It simplifies our search of the data on the destination countries for migrants from Russia and it helps in our teaching work. Thank you very much. And now I would like the, the floor to Anne Helen said, Senior Statistics Coordination Office, the Chris Statistics and Demographics Section Global Data Service, UNHCR. Aina, are you with us? Thank you. Okay. I'm with you. Great. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction and thank you to the organizer and also to the participants. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, represent uh, the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR. I will talk to UNHCR's official population data and also the expert group on refugee and IDP statistics, internally displaced people statistics, also called IGRIS. 
of which uh, UNHCR is a major player. Yeah. Uh, so by way of uh, introducing my uh, presentation, I just wanted to give you some highlights from the uh, recently launched uh, UNHCR 2020 Global Trends Report. Uh, this is uh, one week old, so it's uh, very fresh data. Um, as you can see, um, we have 82.4 million people forcibly displaced globally. This is up from 79.5 million in 2019, uh, so a 4% increase. Uh, this global figure comprises of 26.4 million refugees, uh, 48 uh, internally displaced people, uh, 48 million internally displaced people, sorry, 4.1 million asylum seekers and 3.9 million Venezuelans displaced abroad. It's the ninth uh, year of uninterrupted rise in forced displacement worldwide. Uh, but also worth to note that the vast majority of world's refugees, um, nearly nine in 10, 86%, are hosted by countries uh, in neighboring countries. So in low and middle, middle income uh, countries. Uh, UNHCR's official population statistics uh, is uh, stock and flow figures uh, of our population of concern, which includes refugees, um, asylum seekers, Venezuelans displaced abroad, internally displaced people, returnees, stateless persons, and also other of concern. It also includes uh, components around population change, fertility, uh, mortality, mortality, displacement, onward movements, etc. Uh, our statistics is coming from officially validated and endorsed uh, sources. So mainly government, uh, UNHCR at uh, country, regional and global level, but also other entities. Our annual statistical reporting and our mid-year statistical reporting process is the process where we compile, validate, and endorse uh, data. And it's also go through this process with UNHR operations, regional bureaus, and our, and our HQs. Just quickly touching upon um, a very important resource uh, that we launched uh, one year ago. This is the Refugee Statistics uh, Finder. Uh, and this is a tool to access information on displaced uh, and stateless populations, uh, and also including some key demographics. Um, the, the database also reflects uh, different types of solutions for displaced uh, populations. I'm leaving the, the link to the resource here. I'm not going to go too much more into details on, on how to search. But of course, there are also challenges and there are gaps in our official population data uh, in terms of demographic coverage on sex age data available for only 79% of refugees, 32% of asylum seekers and 44% of IDPs. We have subnational data available for 102 uh, out of the 187 countries reporting. And when we're talking about uh, stateless population figures, the gap is even, even wider. So what do we do to address uh, these gaps? Currently, we are moving um, more and more into uh, statistical and demographic modeling, which can Im improve uh, the work. Um, there is efforts around uh, stateless population estimation and also around age and sex uh, distribution. We're also working closely with, the, with national governments in building their capacity in collecting data on forcibly dis displaced. Uh, and this is a nice segue into uh, my next theme for the presentation, which is a 
is a presentation of the expert group on refugee and, and IDP statistics, also known as the, as the IGRIS. The, the IGRIS was established uh, based on this continuously um, increase in the number of forcibly displaced. There was also a recognition that there was need for um, statistical standards and, and definitions. Uh, Fiona talked about the census recommendations. We had recommendations in, in that area. Others had talked about the migration recommendations. We ha have recommendations in that area. And, and there was this need to create similar recommendations in the area of forcibly displaced. Uh, also, the, the recognition that uh, to be able to report on, on some of our global commitments, the Sustainable Development Goals, as well as the Global Compact on Refugees, there is the need to include forcibly displaced in the, in the data uh, reporting. How can you report on poverty reduction if you don't uh, include uh, this large population group? Uh, in addition, there is also the strong belief that including forcibly displaced international statistical systems, um, it will also uh, lead to inclusion in programming, in policy making, and make this uh, extremely vulnerable group of people uh, visible in, in these areas as well. So based on all that, um, in 2016, this group um, consisting of experts from around the globe, got the mandate from the UN Statistical Commission uh, to produce international recommendations on refugee statistics. The group also got a mandate to uh, produce a technical report on statistics on, on IDPs, really taking stock of where we were and also uh, some of the challenges ahead. The mandate of the group was extended to um, build on the technical report on IDP statistics and produce uh, international recommend recommendations on IDP statistics as well. Uh, further, uh, producing a compiler's manual with the hands-on guidance on how to implement these recommendations on forcibly displaced. In addition, uh, at the last um, UN Statistical Commission, um, well, in person, in the one in, in 2020, um, there was also a, a call to ask the group to develop international recommendations on statelessness statistics, statistics. So the work on this is also ongoing in the group. As I said, the group has global coverage. We have uh, around 45 countries, mainly from the national statistical system. So NSOs uh, from around the globe, I think we have participants from all regions. We also have a number of regional, um, interna uh, regional organizations uh, as members, including um, Eurostat, and of course, international uh, organizations, and quite a few already uh, uh, presented in, in this meeting, I IOM, OECD, uh, and UNFPA, to mention some, and of course, also UNHCR. We also have uh, member countries from, from your region, uh, both as members of IGRIS, but also as supporters of the, of the IROS work. So what does the, the recommendation include? Um, this is an effort to try to summarize very briefly what the two documents include, and you see them here. Uh, both have a statistical framework standardizing re relevant terminology, terminology and classification for IDPs and refugees. There are basic data tabulations and indicators suggested in the recommendations. Also a, a quite extensive discussion of different data sources, um, touching upon census surveys uh, and also administrative data and how to improve them. There is um, long uh, recommendations on socioeconomic indicators to be um, included in data collections both to measure refugee integration, but also well-being and uh, progress towards durable solutions for IDPs. Uh, there is a list of uh, SDG dis indicators to be disaggregated by forced displacement, 12 in total we recommend. And then of course, there's also some recommendations on, around how to coordinate uh, statistical work at country, regional and global level around dissemination, around capacity building, et cetera. Some of the key recommendations, I've tried to, to highlight them here, and it's really around the statistical definitions. 
which are applicable at all levels. Um, and thinking that this will lead to shared standards and also compared uh, statistics between countries and over time. There are other statistical frameworks, both for IDPs and for uh, refugees, quite extensive, recognizing that, of course, there will be able or capacities in every country to implement them, but uh, um, taking also the contextual um, issue into consideration. There is a clear recommendation to expand census and, and national service to refugees and IDPs. Uh, often these have been excluded from national household surveys and also uh, recommendations to include in mix and the DHS and the LFS that many of you are very familiar with. There's the discussion about data sources and maybe uh, highlighting the, the need to integrate the different data sources. Uh, also around principles on, of official statistics and the do no harm and the special attention to protection of these uh, vulnerable groups. And then uh, key recommendations around collaboration and coordination and the importance of having uh, one uh, agency taking the lead. Um, and then the national statistical system would be uh, a recommendation. Also, maybe to try to draw some linkages to some of the points that have been made, mentioned earlier, um, the inclusion of three core migration topics have been mentioned, both by Fiona, but also by others. And in the IRS, we're building on this and we recommend that in addition to these core migration topics, there is also a um, recommendation to include a reason for migration with the following response categories. One on employment, education and training, marriage, family re reunification or family formation, and then forced displacement, capturing refugees, asylum seek seekers, temporary protected status and others. I'm hearing your bell now, so I guess time yes. is up. Just quickly on the last phase uh, that we're currently in for the recommendations. Uh, we've um, developed the recommendations. We have the documents, they're available, um, and we will share the link in the chat so you can access them. We're now in the third phase of work. We got an extended mandate from the UN Statistical Commission. We will report back on progress in 24. Now it's really about implementing the recommendations. We got funding from the EU and also from the joint data center between World Bank and UNHCR to work with countries building their capacity and, and do training so that we'll be able to implement the, the um, uh, recommendation in close collaboration with, with the migration community. Um, we also um, will continue the work on the international recommendations on statelessness statistics and will submit these for endorsement to the UN Statistical Commission in 2023. The process is open. We are very, we are an inclusive group. Uh, if there is an interest from this region to participate, please contact us. Uh, then you're welcome to join any of these working groups around promotion, dissemination, capacity building or knowledge sharing. Um, and on that note, just over to the last slide and our contacts and over to you, Olga. Отлично. Большое спасибо, Каролина. Thank you very much, Carolina. Thank you very much, Anna. I would like to think that the measuring of uh, forced migration for our countries is quite topical because from time to time there is a situation resulting in the displacement of me, people who cross international borders and move within the country. And think these recommendations that was mentioned by Anna are not well known in our region and they need special study because they expand uh, our uh, view on statistics of forced migration. It is not as simple as we might seem sometimes. And I think that there was a separate discussion probably at a separate seminar dealing with measurement of forced migration Thank you very much, Aina. And I give the floor. We're a bit. We we'll have a presentation by Rebecca Kinsella. I give the floor to Natalia Mikhailovna Kisilova, an expert of Interstate Statistical Committee of the CIA State, who will take, uh, tell us in a couple of words about our regional experience of integration uh, data on migration. You can share the screen. Please, Laura, do it for Natalia Mikhailovna. Just five minutes.
Laura, will you help? Can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon. Can you see my presentation now? Probably you haven't shared the screen. Press the green button, please, and it will be launched. I have shared the screen. I see yours. Yes, thank you. Да, готово, пожалуйста, Наталья Михайловна. Please, Natalia Mikhailovna. And you can start your presentation. You have shared the screen successfully. We can see it, please. Five minutes. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I will try to be brief. Uh, but first, I would like to thank a very interesting presentation presented by Anna Prokhorova last October under the project of qualitative data efficiency policy on migration and remittances and the pandemic. I would like to inform you that it will be translated into the Russian language and uploaded on the site of Statistical Committee of the CIS and you will get acquainted with it now. I will briefly tell you about the fact that currently at the CS Statistical Committee we launch a, a software and hardware complex at the analytical portal that makes it possible to implement automation of the work of the experts of statistical services of the CS states, including the use of personal areas, uh, control of information and control of single base for storing and processing of statistical data as well as, well as creating the exchange uh, mechanism of statistical data including the mix format that is important for presenting metadata so that they will be uh, connected with the data on migration. Now, I won't enumerate the data that are collected by the Statistical Committee of the CIS. I will just show the data that are currently downloaded into the database of the Statistical Committee. These are the data on the uh, international migrant stock who came to the country, who left the country, a migration game. It is involved in the uh, calculation of the population. These are not just the migration data and the main uh, disadvantage is the data completeness since not always the countries have a possibility to present the amount of data received from different sources but now we are working on uploading the information on migration based on social demographic characteristics and it is planned in near future. Statistical Committee of the CIS is also propagates and publishes the information on migration situation in its publications. In the last publication, uh, of the CS states was on the sustainable development goals. That was a publication of the youth at 15 to 29 years old. There was information on migration in this group. Uh, as to the quality of data, that question also arises when we work with any database since the countries now receive the information from the source documents on registration of the arrivals and departures. But Ukraine, Moldova, and Armenia uh, give, uh, receive the data from the population register. And there are some difficulties when there are no data 
that are required to be presented so that there would be a full-fledged database of the CIA Statistical Committee carries out such work in order to integrate more and more of these data so that they would be more precise. That's probably all. That was my brief information. Excellent. Thank you very much, Natalia Mikhailovna. I know the difficulties of Statistical Committee of CS and the efforts uh, you uh, uh, just pay uh, to maintain the information exchange due to, uh, despite the objective difficulties that we have in our space. Thank you very much for our work. It makes easier the life of many users, such as I, because we can find the data on the countries of our region in the Russian language in your statistical publication. Thank you very much. And now I would like to give the floor to Rebecca Kansela, who has joined us, has joined our conference. He will tell us about the new management of IOM on measuring the economic uh, impact of your diaspora beyond remainder. Roberto, we do not hear you. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, now it's okay, please. Okay, thank you very much and apologies for uh, the delay as there's some technical issues with the connection, but I'll, I'll try to make up for the time now. Um, I'm here to present a guidance document, um, just a cute few quick words about the background. Essentially what we identified was that there's an endemic lack of data on diaspora contributions beyond remittances. When we talk, we know that diasporas contribute in, in many different ways and in terms of investment, knowledge transfer, uh, philanthropy, trade promotion, but we have no concrete statistics on that because the data that is collected on these kinds of uh, flows are often not disaggregated by uh, migration status, which is actually one of the, the key targets under uh, SDG 17, uh, which uh, specifically 1718 speaks about disaggregation of data by migratory status. And but what we have is. Can I, can I ask you to speak a little bit slower because our interpreter cannot focus? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, what we end up having is that there's an overemphasis on remittances, as this is the one bit of data that we have on uh, national and regional levels. And unfortunately, that overemphasis can sometimes lead to policies that. Uh, ignore some of the important characteristics of remittances as private money transfers from one individual to another. Um, we can think of policies, for example, trying to tax remittances that often uh, backfire. Um, and then we also uh, have to take into consideration that remittances sometimes aggravate existing inequalities and distort consumption behavior. So we want to look beyond just this very narrow uh, set of data that we have for diaspora contributions. And to do that, we developed this guidance document, um, which looks at other kinds of diaspora economic contributions. We still focused on economic contributions as um, these are easier to quantify than knowledge transfer uh, and things like that. But we hope to expand even further in the future. Um, and basically the guidance looks at how existing data collection methods can be uh, adjusted to be able to disaggregate data by uh, migratory status and specifically membership as a member of a country's given diaspora. Um, the guidance uh, is as practical as possible. It includes uh, six steps of 18 actions, 14 case studies, and a toolbox of 12, uh, 13 practical tools. I'll just give you a quick rundown of what the, the guidance contains as the inter introduction, of course. Then the second chapter goes through the six steps, including all the subsidiary actions, as you can see here on the screen. Um, and th basically these steps guide th through the process of developing a diaspora data framework and a phased implementation plan where the uh, adjustments that can be made in the short term are identified, those that will take more time, that can be done in the medium term with uh, a vision towards what is the diaspora data that the country wants to collect on the long-term perspective. So the idea is to have a vision of what are the priorities, what are the indicators the country needs, what are the data points, 
and how to get there in a phased step-by-step -step approach. Then the third chapter actually uh, provides a menu of different options on how existing uh, data collection methods can be adjusted to capture data on these different categories of diaspora contributions that you can see on the screen, uh, investment, trade, tourism, philanthropy, and employee comp compensation. And these are all looking at adjustments to existing data collection methods. So for example, including codes in the international uh, transaction reporting system that most countries are using, or uh, specific codes or questions in the customs declarations or, uh, or also in enterprise um, surveys. So very small adjustments that could be made on existing tools based on the country context. So the idea is that these are, they said a menu and each country can choose what suits best to the country and to the context in the country. And finally, as I alluded to before, um, there is a toolbox that includes uh, concrete uh, tools that can facilitate the process uh, described in the previous sections. Um, from that, I just want to pull out a few case studies that are a bit uh, illustrative of the kind of adjustments that are proposed. And these are case studies that have been implemented by individual countries, um, but without an overarching framework, which is what is proposed in this guidance document. So this is an example from Egypt, where all new businesses or business expansions are required to be registered with uh, the, uh, the relevant government authority. And I know that the text is a bit hard to see, but uh, you'll see that there are columns where the shareholders have to indicate their residency and citizenship uh, in this uh, registration form. That then allows uh, the government to start identifying uh, businesses that have uh, more than 10% or what's considered a, a significant um, share of di diaspora uh, ownership. So in this case, Egyptians are siding overseas. Another example is from Morocco, where they have disaggregated data on tourism receipts, not only by year, but by country. And this is the last one I'll share, um, is the example from uh, Kenya, where the Equity Bank has identified diaspora accounts using the country code of their telephone to be able to identify which uh, account holders are outside of the country. And using that information has been able to identify over um, 3,000 accounts with a total of 35 million in loans and 45 million in savings. And I'll be sharing my contact information and the link to the uh, to the document in the chat and happy to take questions um, bilaterally for anybody who's interested in more information. Um, thank you again for this opportunity and apologies for the, the technical issues earlier. Thank you, Roberta. And, uh, so far, we, have, we do not have time to discuss, uh, but it's very interesting. Um, uh, thank you very much. Now we end our seminar. We have three minutes and I hope that we'll be able to do it within three minutes. Now I give the floor to the statistician head of the project of increasing statistical potential in the Russian Federation of the World Bank, Mr. Erben Holtenhul, please, beyond. Buyant, you are welcome. Switch on your microphone, please. We do not hear you. No, not yet. No, I do not hear. No. We cannot hear you so far. Your microphone is switched um, is switched uh, off, uh, so you, you can uh, switch it on, please. Microphone выключен. У нас остается две минуты. Microphone is off. Two minutes are left. 
Катя, мы можем что-то сделать? У нас мы не слышим. Давайте я попробую сказать свои слова. For the wonderful presentations, for the new uh, knowledge uh, that we have received just now. And I would like to note that we didn't have uh, sufficient time for the discussion, for exchanging the experience among the speakers. There were no representatives of executive authorities that are responsible for migration policy. There were practically no scientists. I think that will fill up that gap in future because only when expanding the uh, well, uh, scope of the stakeholders with exchanging of appearance and feedback, we can move forward and develop this important segment of information and statistics of migration. Once again, allow me to thank all the attendees, and I hope that probably Buyan will say a few words if it is technically not possible. I hope that we'll organize several seminars of the kind when we are going to consider different specialized aspects of migration statistics, which are quite numerous and which are politically significant and interesting for broad range of users. Now, I'm working for the demand from Rostad. Can we finish the seminar? Or probably Buyan will say a few words. Ekaterina Viktorovna, please, what's your opinion? Well, have exceeded our limit even by one yeah. minute. Thank you very much. I would like to thank everyone. On behalf of Rostat, I would like to thank the organization, the organization of the event, all the participants, all the speakers. We have a wonderful event. I think that was a good event. We are sorry for any technical problems. There are some technical problems, and she couldn't get connected. But on the on behalf of the World Bank, she also helps us, uh, thanks us for organizing the event. OK, thank you very much, thank dear you. colleagues. I hope take care of your health. See you next time, please find your ideas concerning the questions on migration statistics that uh, should be discussed in this format. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. Goodbye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank everyone. Without your support, that would be impossible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope we'll meet next time, I suppose, and everything will be even better. Thank you. Thank you. All the best to you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.